Felicity Frog. Nobody was to me now. Where the faggot is. All right. You fairy. Do you feel depressed? Are you sick of the Miami Dolphins? Uh -huh. Do you want something a little exciting for a change? Oh, sure. no! And you got to start watching the Miami Hurricanes! <laughs> Yo, it's a football game, a boxing match, and a riot all wrapped up in one. Even our announcers are done with the cars. Well, that's what I'm talking about. You come into our house, you should get your behind kick. You don't come in the old OP playing that stuff. You across you across the ocean over there. You across the city. You can't come over to our place talking noise like that. You get your foot beat. I was about to go down the elevator and get in that thing. Yo, so if you want real entertainment, check out the Miami Hurricane. Ain't that right, baby? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Anyway, QM sports time is ten oh one. I don't think I ever heard that before in my life. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Do they say that all the time? Everyone everywhere says it every time. In this, on this station, we make fun of them all the time when I do the show. I never heard that in my life. Well, we don't know what that is. There, we, I, I came up with a formula. Sports time. Yeah, the, for, it's the sports time. It's different from regular people's time. Well, that's what I was thinking. What is sports time as compared to just plain old pedestrian regular time? You multiply regular time by pi r squared, the square mm -hmm. root of pi r squared, and then you get the sports time. Oh, and you get a pie in the face, too? Yeah. Remember that uh, Ron Hersey, those great bits that he did on the... Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I remember. I was just thinking about that a couple Why? of minutes ago. Why were you? Here's the poll from yesterday. Let's just move right along, okay? Don't start uh, knocking everybody just because they won't listen to your stupid comments, Mr. Anti-Sports. Bo Capper's right. It's the anti-sports room, man. George is in there like he hates sports. <laughs> you know, I just hate watching it and talking about it. And I agree. I don't, I don't mind watching it. In fact, maybe we got a hockey game on here somewhere. It wouldn't surprise me at all. Back to Brewer. There's his shot in that time. See, there's a, a, a Leaf game from about 100 years ago. Boy, they sure were a lot better then, I'll tell you that. At any rate, who the hell cares? Lupul's team in the front of the goal. The owners are changing. Smith has shot and Jaguar just got a piece. Spittery pass. Lupul robs short point. Do so you want to hear the whole, whole game? Are you, is that a trick question? What do Americans yeah. <laughs> do better than anybody else in the world was our poll yesterday. We had 1,750 votes, 1,400 plus during the show. Well, no, 15, wasn't it? 1,500. It was. Wow. Spend money on crap, 522. Yeah, those Ron Hersey bits in retrospect were really funny, weren't they? Uh, no. Stay stupid, 298. Deny reality, 248. When is Clarence getting fired? That's, a, that's our poll question today. How much longer is it going to be before Joe Bell finally wakes up and realizes that Clarence is a moron, an idiot, a silly sports nerd? You're fired, Clarence. Deny reality, 248. That's what we're doing at QM. We're denying reality. Make war, 150. Kill, 130, which I guess goes hand in hand, although they do a lot of killing each other, too. Pollute, 110. Waste time, 69. They do movies better than anybody else, 60. They screw their brains out, 52. Although, like I was saying yesterday, it's, uh, you know, the human uh, functions, bodily functions are pretty much the same. Yeah. A party slash get intoxicated, 37. They lie. About 30, man. Than anybody else, 30. Medicine, 22. I hate this poll. Only 12. 0.6%. 0 0.6. That sounds like one of our morning numbers. And drive badly, 10. I guess these people have been around. Or maybe they just have heard the stories about how they drive so much worse in, like, uh, other places, which they do. Although South Florida sure puts U.S. in a running. Here's more good news from Iraq before we get into today's pool and important stuff. QM sports time, by the way, is 10.04. <laughs> I, I never heard that before. Are you serious that the uh, people on our station actually say that? Listen, I've been making fun of it for years. And I never I, heard that. Try to get an explanation. What does and, it mean? Uh, the explanation Are we supposed is, to say that? Um, QAM sports time. According to Clarence, um, the QAM sports time is the time we take the breaks on the log. What are you talking about? That I asked him that question, what is the QAM sports time? When did you ask him that? When we were making fun of it recently, when George was doing the show. Oh. Well, leave it to George to be making fun of anything to do with sports. <laughs> That's the time we take the breaks? No, it's not. They weren't taking any break when he said that. They were coming back from a break. So we were saying QAM poon time and QAM casual sex time. And, yeah. You know, just to be different. I don't know what time that is either, but, you know, huh. sounds more interesting to me. Here's the good news from Iraq, because uh, let's face it, we are not going to stay the course. 
Four U.S. Marines. You know, I had a quadruple header on the throne this morning. Wow. I mean, it's really? not necessary that I tell you that quadruple, and I think uh, quintuple is coming up. Quaranta Barana. Wow. Four U.S. Marines and one Navy sailor have been killed in fighting in Iraq's volatile Anbar province, the military said today, bringing October's death toll among American forces to 96. We got a shot at 100. Oh, oh yeah. Just staggering. The new monthly toll equals the previous recent monthly high, that of October of last year, continuing a trend that has October on track to be the deadliest month for U.S. forces in two years. You can hear those voices screaming. I'm dying over here. And, of course, they're dying for a good cause. That's what your president told his sister. We still haven't figured out what that cause is, but freedom's on the march. Because I want to make money. That's why. Right. That's cause. We're going to have a spread democracy all throughout the Middle East, whether they want it or not. Now, today's poll, Halloween. When is Halloween? Tuesday. Tuesday. Well, are you getting ready to get your sack and go out trick-or-treating? One of those Well, oh, there's the phone. I bet you there's a package downstairs. But I'm sure it's nothing important. Maybe it'll be a treat. Halloween is. We have 927 votes already, which means we're going to have 1,000 very soon. By the way, QM Sports Time is 10.06. <laughs> I, I just, it's just, you know, I realize that the sports All obsession this... is like a sickness and that, and that they're doing numbers that are so infinitesimal that it's just embarrassing. But you're just not making any progress with Kenny. I, He's obviously, I, both I've campers said, are a lot bigger listen, than you are and he's no a lot more intimidating. I've said everything I can say. Yeah. Well, you know, nobody listens to me. Well, evidently he's decided to listen to Clarence because he wants to keep the gig. Gonna miss Halloween you. is, we have 937 votes, fun, 390. Only for little kids, 258. Annoying, 94. Stupid, 66. The good thing in my building here is that uh, they have a big sign down there. There's no uh, door-to-door trick-or-treating allowed. Uh, they have, like, a special room. In fact, they're inviting people to go out and buy candy and donate it at the uh, concierge and leave the candy so they can give it to everybody's kids. Screw that. Because if I go out and buy a bunch of candy, you know what's going to happen, don't you? You're going to eat it. Right. Fat pig. Halloween is annoying, 94. Oh, you know, come on. Most, give me a break. Fat pig my ass. Yeah. You're right, though. I am fat. Stop. Annoying, 94. Stupid, 66. A waste of time, 47. Well, come on now. Waste don't of time. do it. I hate this pool. Only 26, 2.7%. It's witchcraft, 26. That's Ooh, what Frank Sinatra Ooh. said. I bet Ooh. you don't have that. On Capitol Records, Frank Sinatra. It's witchcraft. He was so bad. And uh, Dangerous 20. Well, it's dangerous if you're, like, uh, going out there and doing a bunch of nasty things. Dangerous for the kids if they get those poison uh, apples. Apples with the razor blade in them, stuff like that. Yeah. And then come to find out there never was. Uh, that's no. just uh, urban myth. Another urban legend. The apple with the razor blade in it. There, was, there never was any oh. such thing. Although in Buffalo, once upon a time, many years ago, a bunch of prankster kids, you know, a bunch of really jackass kids, mm-hmm. what they did is they took, like, um, uh, I guess, a screwdriver. And they made, they went up and down the railing, you know, and they made like indentations in the wooden rail, in the railing. Okay. And then they stuck upside down razor blades in there, you know, the old Gillette blue blades. Yeah, that's not nice. Ooh, man. Can you even begin to imagine that? Uh, Talk about the pain. By the way, don't give apples out on Halloween. What what are you people thinking? Why not? It's sure better for you than the candy. candy. It won't rock your teeth and uh, cause cavities. What are you working for the Dental Association? You'll get the apple thrown back to George 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 and Josh are getting a real treat tomorrow. Yeah, we are. Jackson's is bringing in ice cream and weenies. That's right. All right. You know? You didn't know about that? I Josh. Josh just uh, finding out. Well, there you go. And Jackson's annual anniversary celebration is going to be held on Saturday, November 18, from 7 to 10 p.m. It's their major fundraising event for Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital. Last year, they raised over 10 grand. The recently completed pediatric emergency care facility includes a treatment room sponsored by Jackson's. This year's anniversary celebration features a musical and video retrospective look at Jackson's through the decades. They've been around for a zillion years, Jackson's. Fifty years. Musical celebrity entertainers will be on hand to help rock the night away. Other activities of the anniversary celebration include a silent auction and raffle sponsored by dozens of local business uh, businesses and the sale of food and soft drinks from which all proceeds benefit Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital. Raised a lot of money for them, they have. So their 50th anniversary party and fundraiser is November 18, 7 to 10 p.m. Jackson's in the Dania, of course. Well, that's a... Legendary place. There aren't too many places around that have been around as long as them. Nope. Most, most of the great places from the days of uh, long gone by are long gone. By the way, QM Sports Time is 10-10. <laughs> I, I just, I don't know, that just uh, <laughs> caught me off guard, I guess. I was just sitting here minding my own business, getting ready to do the show. I heard Kenny say, QM Sports Time is 9-50. I thought, what are, you, what are you talking about? What, are you, <laughs> what kind of drugs are you doing, man? That is scary. Sports time, my ass. So, yeah. Clarence try, so, in other words, that's a Clarence thing. I mean, as if I have to ask. Well, I, I think it's been... Uh, uh, I think the only way we're going to solve this situation years. is to assassinate Clarence. Uh, now, which one of you wants to take uh, that on? Oh, you know, me, I'm a pacifist. I don't get involved in such no. things. Come on, Josh. 
There's only room for one Josh at QAM. Oh, we got two more. Yeah, there's like eight Joshes here. I'd have to Who go else we got? I'd have to go postal. Josh Crone. Yeah, but he's not at QAM. Oh, he's well, that's Luke Crone's son. Luke Crone from WNWS. I could tell you lots of Luke Crone stories, but then Josh Crone would get all upset. I better not do it. Well, Josh hey, Lou, you're guy. an idiot. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Josh Crone is a good guy. Well, so that, just because his father's an idiot doesn't mean I'm saying he is. He's a good guy, probably. I mean, look at Chicka's son. Anyway, and who's the other Josh? I think that's it. You said there's a couple more. Well, I lied. We, we lied. lied. We miscounted. Well, that lied. means that you're uh, stuck with a job now. You've got to assassinate the uh, program director. Oh, here's a great story. Now, maybe not kill him right off the bat. If you want to get the message across, listen to this story. It'll plant a subliminal idea in your brain. North Fort Myers. Where else could things like this happen? A North Fort Myers man has been charged with aggravated battery. He allegedly bit off the finger of a 76-year-old man. Hey, just go bite him. Andrew Avalmar, 35, was charged this week after he allegedly bit off an inch of the man's finger, according to the news press. Avalmar was asked to um, leave the victim's home last week, but returned and attempted to choke the man with a jacket. The victim's wife used a utility knife to cut away the jacket, police reports said. Reports indicate the victim was trying to get Avalmar off his wife when his finger was bitten. Avalmar was arrested on Saturday for trespassing, released on Monday. He was uh, charged Tuesday with aggravated battery, causing bodily harm or personal injury. He's in Lee County Jail. We'll come invade you out, by the way, after you bite off Clarence's finger. We'll come invade you out. I'll, I'll, I'll send a check down there. All right. Josh. No, I'm, I'm serious. That's the only way it's obvious to me that Joe Bell just uh, don't get it. Either, either that or maybe Josh has got naked pictures of Joe Bell. Back during his limp days, you know, where he had certain... Uh, no. I don't. Private problems. Yeah, yeah. He had a problem with his privates, but it wasn't it wasn't that. He had trouble peeing or something like that. I guess we can't talk about such things, you know. We can't talk about much of anything. That's that's the amazing part. How the hell do we do it, you know? What? With all <laughs> by the way, QM sports time is ten thirteen. <laughs> the biggest names, the best talent. Oh, right. This is Neil Rogers. Call me Radio five sixty QAM. Hey, George, this is uh Robert. Um I'm playing and out of town all the time on business or whatever. I was looking for a good sports talk radio station and happened to find Neil Rogers. Uh, to be honest with you, pathetic. Very pathetic. And uh, this guy, is, I mean, if this is all you got on sports talk radio, it is horrible. So I'd, I'd definitely try to find somebody better, that's for sure. And his whole GD thing and everything else, just tell him one day we'll all face the Lord. All right? Have a great day. Oh, God! <laughs> Jennifer, you know there's been some rumors that Vince has been cheating. I honestly, I, I've got to tell you, I don't see it. Well, you're going to see it now because I've got photos. Here you go. Oh, my God. Yep, his tongue is so far down her throat, he can taste her G-string. Oh, how could I be so stupid? And here's a picture of him riding her like she was sea biscuit. We are so over. Eh, that's no big deal. It's a big deal. <laughs> hey, Jennifer, i, I got to confess. We photoshopped both of those pictures. What? None of it ever happened. You should <laughs> never be allowed to talk to people. 1018, if I, that's our QM sports time. See, I'm, you got to remind me to be saying that now. I'm not, just not in the habit of saying that. Well, we'll try to get in the habit. We don't want to be out on a limb, okay? We don't want to be out of the ordinary. We want to be a part of this uh, thing, don't we? No. no. Yeah, well, right now it's QM bacon time. I already had mine, as thanks. you know. Thanks, Elvis. Thanks to our friends at Howie's, and thanks to our buddies at the Jacksons for bringing all that ice cream and uh, weenies tomorrow for George and Josh. Bet. By the way, uh, speaking to Josh, Clarence, if I was you, I'd be real. Josh told me during the break on the intercom, he said, I'd to be real careful next time I started my car mm -hmm. if I were Clarence. They have those mirrors on the end of a stick, you know, that you uh -huh. can check underneath with? Yeah, Clarence, I'd stick it. Democrats have taken an 11-point lead, 44 to 33 percent, over Republicans less than two weeks before the election, according to the very latest Reuters Zogby poll. It's hot in my hand in the page, too. That's what Mark Foley said. He'd like to have a hot page in his hand. Voters strongly favor Democratic candidates over Republicans in the November 7th. Oh, speaking of that, how's that movie coming? What's the name of it again? Mean Creek. Mm. Like Mean Greek. Have they killed that kid yet? Oh, I better not turn that on. There's a lot of, a lot of language. <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah. Lots and lots of language in there. Yeah, like that. Voters strongly favor. Boy, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to have to do another Joyce here during this next break. Wow. In fact, I might have to do it right now in the chair. That's usually me uh, running to the bathroom. I don't understand what that's all about. Yeah. Here's George. No, I don't think so. But <laughs> no, if I disappear, you'll understand what happened, because I'm sure you're not going to soil my chair like somebody we know. Howard! Voters strongly favor Democratic candidates over Republicans in the November 7th congressional election harbor growing doubts 
about the Iraq war and the country's future, Reuters says. Growing doubts. Well, they're a little bit slow, but they're finally catching on. The poll also finds that about 50% of likely voters believe U.S. troops should be pulled out of Iraq by the end of next year, including 15% who favor an immediate withdrawal, like me, and 20% who want out by the middle of next year. Eleanor Clift. Eleanor, you're swollen her. <laughs> political analyst for Newsweek examines the political climate that give Democrats a print overall lead. She says the voters are repudiating one-party government, and she predicts the GOP will suffer major losses. Oh! Like Stan major losses. Whatever happened to Stan? Did he ever uh, pay me back that money? No. Just a joke, Stan. Relax. Well, the good news is Danny Rowling is dead. Aren't you excited? I'm not excited. I'm glad. You ought to be excited, man. You ought to be having a party in your pants. All Danny right. Rowling, the man who murdered five University of Florida students and plunged the city of Gainesville into panic in the summer of 1990, was executed last night. The governor's office said Rowling 52 died around 6.13 p.m. I guess 13 was an unlucky number for Danny, too, huh? Mm-hmm. See that? Danny Marino? And by the way, I don't know about you, but I'm getting... Oh, I don't want to say it. I better not say it. Danny, just go away. Don't go away mad. Just go away already. God, he's just everywhere. Rowling didn't give a last word just before he died. Instead, he sang a hymn in his haunting southern drawl. Rowling, who had a Pentecostal advisor minister to, uh, minister to him before his execution, repeatedly sang, None greater than thee, O Lord, none greater than thee. Oh, I would love to have heard that. Not... The song also made... You know, the reason I played that voicemail, which is pretty obvious, though, yeah, he's looking for all sports radio. See, anybody that's looking for all sports radio, drop dead. That, that's my comment. Get a life. Please. <laughs> I have no life. <laughs> if this is the best you got on all sports radio, you know, even during the summer book with George on most of the time, I'd say that with no disrespect. It's not taken. I beg your pardon? I said not I mean, taken. like I said... Neil Rogers, good. <laughs> George Rodriguez, no good. We We're sitting there with a 7.3 share in midday, and uh, around, you know, around us is, uh, oh. but God forbid that, you know, we should have something other about, hey, how about those dolphins? Don't they really suck? Isn't Nick Saban really an idiot? Yeah, and now what? Why uh, would anyone want to talk about anything else? those Aren't they a bunch of gangsters? Yeah, and now what? Why would what anyone about? want to talk about anything else? That's right. Well, By the way, QM sports time is 10.22. I, I just, I still can't believe he said that. You have I to told get, you. No, you I, have to do a better job listen, of getting through to him. I, I, I've done my damnedest. And I told you they were ding-donging him to death, didn't I? They're ding-donging him. Well, where's Joe Bell with that ding-dong? Where's Francis Horowitz when we need her from ding-dong school? The song also made a reference out of the New Testament book of Corinthians about seeing through a glass now darkly. Danny Rowling was singing last night, saw through a glass now darkly. About 15 members of the victim's families watched the execution, some stone-faced, some shaking their heads, and some grimacing and rubbing their eyes. Some were rubbing their... The five victim students who had just arrived at UF after the summer break and were preparing for classes were mutilated, and some of the women were... Sorry. ...sexually assaulted. Rowling died after a final appeal with the U.S. Supreme Court was unsuccessful. He pleaded guilty in 1990 to the murders of us got the names. You know, you know, do we really need to go through the names again? No. 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 During the afternoon yesterday, about 200 people gathered outside Florida State Prison, about evenly divided between pro- and anti-death penalty advocates. Supporters of the death penalty, among them friends of the victims, began cheering and whistling when news that the execution had occurred leaked out. Reminds me of the John Wayne Gacy execution. Remember that? Mm-hmm. And he was so cocky that he, right up until the end, he thought he was going to get uh, off the hook. Can you get me off the hook for old time's sake? Can't do it, pervert. Opponents of the death penalty stood in a circle and began singing Amazing Grace. Oh, God. It's just justice for the victims. It doesn't bring them back, but at least they know he's going to meet his maker. See, just like that guy said on that voicemail, he's going to have to meet his maker someday, you know? Oh, God! Marvin Maker, he's still grabbing at Monticello, I bet. Said Tony Wilson, 34, who was to be the roommate of victims Sonia Larson and Christy Powell. Oh, I love that. Wilson did not have a chance to move in yet before her fellow students were slain. Who's singing that? Who is that? Judy Collins. Huh? Judy Collins, good Canadian girl, ain't she? I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Better Google Judy Collins. Gee, what, what are you talking about? Like I have to look that up? Sure, of course you. I don't know. Here we go. The very best of Judy Collins profile. Come on, where the hell is it? Oh, here's the official ball. Oh, man, is she old and ugly now? Wow. Woo! Not that she ever looked really good, but wow, wow, wow. She is nasty. Here's her big head. Both sides now. You know it, baby. Do it, Judy. Where's the, uh, where's the beef here? Where's the, you know... Don't you hate that? Yes. I, I guess it. if we did Wikipedia, though, we could find out what, uh, what am I looking for? Where she was born? Well, hurry up, because we're running out of sports time. 
<laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, I got news for you, man. That's what your problem is. It's always sports time. We'll never run out of sports time. When you're in the Clarence uh, Darrow world, it's always sports time. You never run out. Even at the end of time, it'll still be sports time. And if you look at those numbers, I think we're getting close to the end of time. <laughs> oh, man. I think some people are getting close to the end of time. QAM sports time is 1026. It's just, it's just amazing. You know what it's like? It's like Rita Cosby. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's in the same category. In fact, if I were to think of one word for it, it's just stupid. That's it. Excellent job, Mo. What is it? Stupid. Right. See, I told you he had his thumb in it. And boy, when he pulled it out, man, oof, people were running like crazy. Hey, you ought to run right over to Lou Backroad Chevrolet right now because they got a fabulous thing going on this month. And we just got a few days left in October. We want to help them get to their goal. They want to, for the first time in their history, sell a thousand cars in one month. So they've got Lou Backroad Chevy's Race to a Thousand going on right now. At Lou Backroad Chevrolet, you'll find the largest selection of new and used cars, including those hot new Corvettes, the ultimate, not just the ultimate sports car, the ultimate vehicle in the universe. Take it from me. I know I've been driving them for a long, long time. They got your trucks, SUVs, the biggest selection of minivans anywhere around. They've also got used cars starting at just thirty nine ninety five. Every one of them backed by a Carfax guarantee. And just like me, you love car shopping at Lou Backroad because there's no high pressure. They give you a fabulous service. Their salespeople are friendly. They know their crap, and their selection of vehicles and prices are unbeatable. Lou Backroad's out to sell a thousand cars this month, and they're staying open until midnight every night to get to their goal. Like us here on the show, we got a thousand seventeen votes already. Holy cow! Forget the price, make them an offer, and they'll beat any deal. Make them an offer they can't refuse, and they probably won't. More money for your trade, 0% financing, rebates up to six grand, whatever it takes to get to their goal of just pumping out them cars. Only a Lou Backroad Chevy with two locations for you. They're in Pompano Beach, a quarter mile west of I-95, and a Coconut Creek on 441, just south of the Sawgrass. Don't forget Lou Backroad staying open until midnight every night this month to get to that goal, so get your ass over for an unbeatable deal to Lou Backroad Chevrolet. Or check them on their web at Lou Backroad, that's B-A-C-H-R-O-D-T, Lou Backroad. Dot com. The biggest names, the best talents. This is Neil Rogers, Sports Radio 560, QAM. Judy Collins was born in Seattle, although she did record uh, songs written by a Canadian. Well, that's close enough. Seattle, yeah, close, close enough. enough. You know, by the way, QAM Sports Time is 1031. I know that the Lord even loves Neil Rogers. The U.S. Census Bureau actually has a meter that is clicking up the numbers. One baby is born every seven seconds. One person dies every 13 seconds. And every half minute, an immigrant enters the country. This counter will turn to 300 million. That's Hello, people. Who are you, people? It's going to be crowded. So many people. Traffic was a biatch. Uh, millions of people. On the Wake up in the morning and just want to drive until the car goes off a cliff someplace. It's her pretty nice olive garden and just want to be friends and they had a whole bottle of wine. And... Scientists have been cloning humans for years. Oh, you want to peek your guts out? The uh, Clintons have said that their daughter Chelsea was named after Judy Collins' recording of the song Chelsea Morning. You'll also need exclusive access to the men's room. <laughs> I'm going to poo in front of people? That's disgusting. So he soiled himself on the couch right in front of our son. Make sure to give those toilets a good scrubbing. We want the old girls smart men. If you really gotta go, run. I was just squatting on the old girl during that break, as a matter of fact. I can't have sex with you. Hell, I'm a damn sex king. It seems they're reproducing it well. And they have birth loads of kids. They're born pregnant. I had to wait tables seven months pregnant. Oh, and she posed nude for uh, something in 1979, Judy Collins. Oh, what a grotesque thought that is. Yeah, kind of. What magazine was that? It's, I don't in, know. it's in this article somewhere. I don't really give a crap about Judy Collins, okay? Or both sides now. Who's the uh, folk singer that I'm thinking of was Canadian? I don't know. Man Murray? 
She ain't no folk singer, okay? You pick it on poor man Marie again? Okay. Christ. Christ on a crutch. I'm sorry to get that guy all upset again. I was looking for a good so sports, about a female? sports station. Who? Female Canadian folk right. singer? Uh-huh. Hmm. Well, whatever. New Jersey's highest court opened the door yesterday to making the state the second in the nation to allow gay marriage, ruling that lawmakers must offer homosexuals either marriage or something like it, such as civil unions. Don't do it. In a ruling that fell short of what either side wanted or feared, the state supreme, the state supreme court declared four to three that homosexual couples are entitled to the same rights as heterosexual ones. The justices gave lawmakers 180 days to rewrite the laws. The ruling is similar to the 1999 High Court ruling in Vermont that led that state to create civil unions which confer all the rights and benefits and source available to married couples under state law. Although we cannot find that a fundamental right to same-sex marriage exists in this state, the unequal dispensation of rights and benefits to committed same-sex partners can no longer be tolerated under our state constitution, Judge Barry T. Alban wrote for the four-member majority. I wonder if he's kin to Mark Alban, who drives at Pompano Park. Barry Alban. The court said the legislature must either amend the marriage statutes to include same-sex couples or create a parallel statutory structure that gives gays all the privileges and obligations married couples have, and headaches and heartaches and hate. The three dissenters argued that the majority didn't go far enough. They demanded full marriage for gays. How do you like that? And anyway. All right. So that's what's going on in Jersey, okay? In fact, maybe you'll go to Garden State, where the racetrack used to be. I'm sure it's still sitting there. Well, I'm not really sure at all. That was a beautiful place. They were going to make that into a casino one day. Garden State Racetrack. I've been there. I've been at Garden uh, City, too, which is also no longer there. I've been at a lot of racetracks that no longer exist. After I leave, they just tear them right down. I leave just enough money behind so they can, you know, for all the uh, destruction expense. Oh, speaking of Dan Marino, weren't we just speaking about him moments ago? By the way, QM Sports Time is 1035. <laughs> and we have 1,053 votes on the poll. It would be more fun if it was 1,035. We have the right numbers, but they're not of the right odor. We got 105.3. But at any rate, Football Hall of Famer Dan Marino is featured yet again in a campaign flyer for State Representative Susan Goldstein. Boy! I didn't even know he was Jewish. Even though he's asked at least twice that she stop using his picture. Oh, Danny boy. How's that mean uh, creek doing? It's a good movie. It's, uh, you know, it's okay. Until they uh, kill the kid and then they don't want to do about that chubby. He deserved to get killed. That's right. Oh, I know they're going to say some four-letter word in there, but you see, you've got to stop me from doing that. Don't do that. Okay. Anyway, Marino's camp was irked by a previous flyer because they felt it implied an endorsement of the Western Republican who faces Democrat David Martin David Kyer. For just a second there, I thought it said John Mark Carr, who faces Democrat Martin David Kyer in House District 97. Marino's representative said Goldstein a formal notice to pull ads with the name or photo of the former Dolphins quarterback. Cut the crap, honey. Susan Goldstein is a Republican? Oh, my God. Talk about sellout. Susan, Susan, I've been thinking. Your political choices are really stinking. The two are both parents of autistic children. Marina worked with Goldstein to pass a bill that mandates special certification for swim teachers for children with developmental disabilities. The kids, not the teachers. The bill allocated 535 grand of the Dan Marino Foundation to set up certification criteria and build a special pool. The new ad, a fly boy, I'll tell you, there's nothing like those swimmers, you know. All oh, these are little kids, I guess. I don't know. Ask him, Mark Foley. He'll find out how old they are. The new ad, a flyer sponsored by the Republican Party of Florida, shows a photo of Marino with Goldstein during passage of the bill. By the time the party received Lord of Marino's objections, it couldn't stop the mailing, a spokesman said. A spokesman. There's always a spokesman. You ever notice that? Mm-hmm. Look at that. An inch of snow an hour falling in eastern Colorado. Look at that snow, baby. Our force down south in the county south. Holy of moly. What did I tell you? Stay the hell out of Colorado. It's a horrendous place. The request from Dan Marino went to her campaign, but by the time it had gotten to us, the most recent mailer had already been sent out, said Jeff Sadowski, the party's communication director. Sadowski stressed that no other materials were used in Marino's name or image, adding that Goldstein had nothing to do with the second mailer. Goldstein said she didn't ask Marino to endorse her because she knew he doesn't back candidates. But Goldstein said she's proud of the work that she and Marino did and was trying to tell voters about the great job they did. It was news, she said of the photo. It was published in the newspaper. It was an official photo taken in the House chamber. Goldstein said she's pulled the ads. I changed everything and moved on, she said. Well, you go, Susan. Go far. And re re reexamine your priorities, okay, honey? Republican Susan Goldstein. I once uh, had a girlfriend in elementary school whose name was Susan Weinstein. Yeah? How'd that work out? Well, I mean, it didn't worry. Yeah, I was a little kid. You know, every little kid's got a girlfriend, you know, in school. Mm -hmm. Was it, you know Joni, was it Joni Mitchell? Joni Mitchell, all right. Oh. Very good. Now, how'd you find that? Eric and two faxes. Very, very good. Thank, Thank you very much, Joni Mitchell, Judy Collins. They're looking at the J. Just like Jewish. Are you Jewish? I don't know. 
By the way, I hate Johnny Mitchell. I do, too. I also hate Judy Collins. I don't hate Judy Collins. I just don't want to be bothered with her. Both Sides Now is okay. Yeah, that's okay. I'd rather hear Both Sides Now than this swill that you're playing right now that's with right. Joni Mitchell. Me, too. What is that? Joni Mitchell. But, I mean, what's, what song is that? Help Me. Oh. She needs help. Growing herself in, honey. Okay, kill it. Ugh. After you finish with Clarence, kill that. I'm going to go find Big Yellow Taxi now. Yesterday, Mark Halpern, ABC political director and co-author of the new book, The Way to Win, went on the O'Reilly Factor and agreed with Bill O'Reilly that members of the old media are too liberal and should prove to conservatives that we understand their grievances. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. When O'Reilly pointedly asked him if he believed major news organizations, including ABC, had a liberal bias, Halpern repeated the right-wing talking point that the media is trying to suppress Republican turnout. He told O'Reilly, if I were a conservative, I understand why it feels suspicious that I wasn't going to get a fair break at the end of an election. We've got to make sure we do better so conservatives don't have to be concerned about that, he says. Oh, my God. Mark Halpern, another sellout Jew. Jesus Christ, what is wrong with you, man? Oh, there's uh, Al Sharpton. Uh, also discouraging a lot of voters. As I move around the country, people are absolutely discouraged. They're saying things like, I don't know. But I'm hearing never has heard a discouraging word. Aren't you hearing that? No, I heard it. Never has heard a discouraging word. I heard a word. discouraging word. What was that, sports? Sports time. 1040. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Joni Mitchell. Yeah. What was that song, Yellow... Uh, Big Yellow Taxi. I'm, Big Yellow, was that it? I'm looking for it. That was a, a, a hit. I don't know on what chart, but yeah. I'll be damned. How about Mellow Yellow by Donovan? Oh, don't ever play that. I can't like that. stand. You like Mellow Yellow by Donovan? Get out of here. Not. You're just saying that to get me uh, aggravated. We don't have anything in there. I thought we had a Donovan bit. Da, 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 da. Oh, brother. Those were the days. Thank God it was then and not now. Although I think I'm looking at both sides now. We got 1,073 votes. We might actually get to 1,100 by the top of this hour. Pretty dang close to it. Then what are they going to do across the street? They're probably going to light a Yortzite candle. Oh, no. I can oh, yeah. see the yellow label. Can't you see the yellow label? Was it Epic Records? Or some oh, stupid yeah. thing. Okay. I'm just mad about Saffron. Oh, could he sing or what, huh? No. At Donovan? What was his name, Donovan Leach? Yes. Oh. Boy, one, one thing about every song, every record that he made, they all sounded exactly the same. You want to know why? Because he was singing them, and he sucks. Oh, get out of here. Go away, Donovan. Don't come back. I remember Dick Donovan used to pick about pitch for the White Sox. That kind of a herky jerky uh, delivery. Sunshine Superman. Yeah. What's wrong with this? Sucks. Oh. There's only one thing wrong with that song. You know what it is? What's that? He's singing, singing it. it? Oh. Well, maybe okay, QM Sports Time is 10:42. Bye bye to Donovan. Okay, nice knowing you, Donovan. You're not. Get lost. In fact, maybe he'll elope with Joni Mitchell and Judy Collins. Experience the difference at Mercedes-Benz of Pompano because at Mercedes-Benz of Pompano, it doesn't matter what time of month you purchase your vehicle, it's always going to be the best deal anywhere. Whether it's one of the brand new 2007 Mercedes-Benz luxury sedans, the 2007 GL Class, the first Mercedes-Benz full-size SUV, or their large selection of certified pre-owned cars. When you choose Mercedes-Benz of Pompano, you've got over 200 employees working their ass off to provide you with incomparable service, offering express lube, courtesy vehicles, and complimentary car wash, too. Make an appointment through our business development center. You can even earn dealer miles, just like frequent flyer miles. Browse Mercedes-Benz of Pompano's Indoor Expo with over 150 new and pre-owned vehicles, or you can also check them out on the web at BenzPompano.com, B-E-N-Z, BenzPompano.com. Experience the difference at Mercedes-Benz of Pompano. Call 1-800-NEW-BENZ, N-E-W-B-E-N-Z. You'll find them at I-95 and Copens Road. 1-800-NEW-BENZ for Mercedes-Benz of Pompano. And Gary Sarner says they're a Mercedes dealer like no other he'd be ever seen in his life. The biggest names, the best talent. This is Neil Rogers, Sports Radio 560, Q-A-M. Portals are straight, they're never happy, never get laid as they home all alone. I have no life. In music stores now, George Bush sings the Beatles. Help, help, help I need, need somebody. somebody. Help, help, not just anybody. Help, help. Right, 
Abu Gar, Abu, Abu, Abu Gar, Abu, Abu Gar. Well, I, 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 no, I chose on. Special bonus track featuring Linda McCartney. Dumber than a sack of uh, donkey turds. That's your president. 1047 is QM Sports Time. We've got 1,085 votes. Like I said, by the top of the hour, by the time Little Hand hits Big Ben, it's going to be 1,100 votes. It's going to be 11 out of 11. That is shocking, man. People are screaming about it all around town. Fighting. Guess what I just found? What did you just find? I don't even remember what the hell I was looking for, but this David Citrin guy who's obviously a radio groupie, and I'm sure he's not listening to us because he's, uh, I don't know, he's probably listening to Howard! old Randy Rhodes tapes. But anyway, he's got this thing, uh, David Citrin, South Florida, um... Radio history or some crap like that on the web. Yeah, Radio History of South Florida, 1923 to present. And there's a thing I just discovered on there. Miami Broadcasting Company, WQAM Miami. Do you know what year WQM went on a year? Uh, 1940-something. I don't know. Oh, way before that. Really? Guess again. Uh, 32. Way before that. You got the right numbers, but backward. Wow, 23? Very good. I know it was uh, the first station in Florida. It was America's southernmost broadcaster. How do you like that? Oh, mm-hmm. my God. Alice Brannigan writes, WQM on the move. This is uh, almost interesting, you know what? Hmm. By the way, QM Sports Time. In January of 1923, the Department of Commerce issued a broadcasting license. Oh, I wish we still had it. To the Electrical Equipment Company, 42 Northwest 4th Street in Miami. The auto and radio sales slash service company was owned by W.W. Luce. His new station, WQM, was authorized to operate with 250 watts on 833 kilohertz, 833 on the dial. WQM was the southernmost broadcasting station in the USA. Eh? By the way, ask me how I did at Woodbine yesterday. How'd you do? You want to know. All right. Uh-huh. For whatever reason, within a few brief months, WQM had cut its power back to 100 watts. In those days, the government was driving stations crazy by constantly reorganizing their frequency assignments. This was the Department of Commerce's attempt, inept attempt, at dealing with the rapidly expanding service through regulations governing broadcasting uh, virtually non-existent. By early 24, I well, remember that, 1924, I wonder what the hell they were playing. Does it say in there? I don't know. We'll, we'll get to it. By early 1924, maybe Rudy Valley Records and Enrico Caruso, scratchy old 78s. By 1924 early, the government relocated WQM to 1140 kilohertz, but by July, again ordered, moved to 1,000. Oh, like WCFL. Oh, too bad we're not right there in the middle of the dial at 1,000. By the end of 24, the station had been told to shift to 1120, only be sent back to 1140 in July 25. Well, they sure were moving them around, you know what? Mm-hmm. By that time, WQM was calling itself the Pioneer Broadcast Station of Florida. All right. All right. Stations were not universally pleased with their newly mandated frequency reassignments. During this period of no radio regulation, it was a common practice for stations to ignore federal assignments and simply use their own favorite channels. <laughs> okay. Tomorrow we're going to be at the 600, by the way. In November 25, WQM reportedly jumped to the unauthorized frequency of 1050. Oh, WMGM, WHN, uh, WCHUM, uh, CHUM, uh, using 1,000 watts, though still authorized for 1140 with 100 watts. WQM was still Miami's only year-round broadcaster because WIOD, WMBF shut down during the summertime. Wow. I bet you never knew that. Nope. They shut down during the summertime. We uh, did that during certain day parts this past summer. <laughs> In the spring of 27, the newly formed FCC assigned WQM to 930 kilohertz, permitting the station to operate with 750 watts. By November of 27, QM was shifted to 780 kilohertz. In late 28, QM was moved to 1240. By early 1929, the new licensee became the Miami Broadcasting Company, MBC. They increased power to 1,000 watts and moved the studios to Miami's postal building. We went postal, 327 Northeast 1st Avenue. The Western Electric Transmitter was relocated to the 15th floor of the Wealdy Board Building, 600 Biscayne Boulevard. When these changes were completed, WQM shifted its opposition to 560, 1929. Aren't you excited about that? Thrilled. In January of 30, by the way, QM Sports Time. In January of 32, QM's transmitter was moved to the top of the Miami Daily News Building. In 1938, it was again moved to the water's edge at Biscayne Bay and 14th Street, where a new 224-foot self-supporting Blonde Knox vertical was installed. The station slogan became, The Voice of Tropical America. Um, I can just see Carmen Miranda now with all the, with Chanquanta Banani on her head and all the mother fruits. In 1941, WQM received a permit to increase its daytime power to 5,000 watts. This was completed in November of 43 with the addition of a Continental 315B transmitter. In 1947, a new 380-foot-tall Lehigh self-supported vertical radiating antenna tower was installed on a pier extending out into Biscayne Bay at 1425 Northeast Bayshore, Court, just south of the Venetian Causeway's Miami Terminus. 
Where is our tower? Is that where it still is? Well, I guess if I keep reading, we'll find out. I don't know where it is. Do you know, know where it is? No. Yonder. I think we ought to hang clearance from our tower. That's your assignment, Josh. I'll start planning. In fact, maybe we can use, uh, you know, like, uh, if there's any blood running through his scrawny veins, we can use it like as a, um, a what? Boost, signal booster. Oh, okay. A little amplifier. Action. Right. In 1949, right. QM Studios removed the suite 1723 in the Alfred I. DuPont building in downtown Miami. In 56, the station was sold to Todd Storrs Mid-Continent Broadcasting, later become known as the Storrs Broadcasting Company, S-T-U-R-Z. The studios and offices were moved in 62 to the mezzanine floor of Miami's McAllister Hotel. A permit was also issued that year to change the transmitter site. In 65, the station's main studio was relocated to 767 41st Street, Miami Beach. Huh. The studios remained there until 85 when they were relocated in 9881 Sheridan Street in Hollywood. You don't want to know about that. Oh, brother. Ooh. In early 88, the transmitter was moved to a new site near Miami and commenced AM stereo operation. We're in stereo, can you tell? On this the side. old 5,000-watt continental transmitter was put up for sale. WQM had been running a country music format, but in 1990, the station added oldies and sports talk. The country music format was dropped, though it was continued on the FM outlet WKRS in Boca. Kiss it. As Bubba would say, just kiss it. The oldies music lasted till 93 when the format was changed to all sports, and the station became known as Sports Radio 560. <laughs> In mid-96, the station, along with KISS, became the property of the Sunshine Wireless Company as Sports Radio 560. QM operates uh, full-time on 560, 5,000 watts day, 1,000 watts night non-directionally from its studios in Hollywood. Right. It's still licensed to nearby Miami. What's the date on this thing? It's got so many mistakes in it. In fact, at the end of it, it says a former board op at QAM advised me of an error in the above article, and it says Sunshine Wireless purchased the station in 85 and sold it to Beasley Broadcasting, the current owner in 96. Lots of errors in this article, Alice. I don't know if they're with malice, but a lot of articles, Alice. Mistakes. Thanks to Broadcasting Profile for permitting us to excerpt information from their lengthy report on QM, she says. BPF is a commercial research service that can provide highly detailed historic reports on all U.S. AM FM stations, past and present. Yaddy, yaddy, yaddy. A lot of mistakes in here, including where the studios are located. Of course, who the hell knows when this thing was written, you know? Mm -hmm. It's got a date on it. Article from the June 97 issue of, well, yeah, we've been on the station, what, going on, is it nine years or ten years? Like nine. It seems like a hundred. Yeah. Oh, much too long, that's for sure. Wait till we show up on that all-men station. I'm going to work for James Crystal. Wouldn't that be something if you wanted to work for Crystal? Yeah, that'd be something. <laughs> 1,106 votes on the poll. Boy, I'm going to tell you, you can, can't you smell it that there's something going on? Well, I've been farting a lot. That's what oh, I'm my God. Boy, I can't believe I had a, a, a chink with banana. <laughs> had another visit during that uh, break, two breaks ago. Wow. That's something. I, and I don't know why, because I was busy uh, plunging my guts all day. Yes, they barely ate anything. Although I did come home last night and make some of that uh, low-carb pasta. That was not a good idea. Probably not. Don't be eating no pasta, even the low-carb stuff, before you go to bed, because then it'll send your blood sugar skyrocketing, and then you'll have a massive stroke, and bad stuff will happen to you, and you'll croak. I don't want to croak yet. I have, I'm, my goal in life is to outlive certain people. I don't want to mention any names. You, you can imagine. No. Oh, yeah, you can. Well, ask me tomorrow before the show, I'll tell you. Okay. One in particular. I'm just, no, no, actually, two in particular. Okay. And when either or both of them croak, I'll be more than delighted to fly anywhere in the continental U.S., even to Alaska, in fact, even to Hawaii. I'd love to go back there. I haven't been there in a long time. And dance a Kazansky on their grave. The biggest names, the best talent. This is Neil Rogers, go, 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 go. Sports Radio 560, QAM. Did she say duty? She's with a hair gel and lip balm and toothpaste. Clear it still for all of those bits on your face. You have that sunburn but no solar pain. That's one more thing you can take on a plane. Oh! At the airport, you'll be waiting. It may seem the While they make you throw out all of those things, you can I'm dying over here. 
I just had a brainstorm. I really, you know, I joked about this before. I don't think it's a joke anymore. I think just to show the world, just to make a point, you know, because yeah. this all sports thing is starting to really frost our ass. Because it's not all sports radio. Twenty hours a day at sports, and four hours we have ratings. Okay. So I'm thinking that what we ought to do is like uh, prove a point, and that is this fall book. Well, we're gonna we'll play oldies during the entire rating period. Uh, what do you think? Uh, Get a 15 share easy. You fail. If I have to see Michael J. Fox uh, spazzing around on that spot anymore, you know, I mean, not I don't want to be insensitive, but I don't want to see that. Do you? Uh, not necessarily. He looks like he's got St. Vitus dance in his pants. I understand he's got Parkinson's, and he's doing a very good thing, and I give him all the uh, credits mm-hmm. in the world and uh, props for pops and all this other crap. But the fact of the matter is I don't want to see it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I know. It's uh, unpleasant. It is unpleasant. Not as unpleasant as... Well, actually, now, you notice I didn't play the Erzatz version either. I don't want to aggravate you. Right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Actually, that. I played Thin Lizzy. The actual, real Thin Lizzy. Right. Now, there's some other great hits on here, too. I don't know what they are. <laughs> what? Thin, thin Lizzy's greatest hits? Yeah. It is. The very best of Thin Lizzy. It's, uh, let's see, Jailbreak. Do you want to hear some of that? Okay. That's enough. Yeah. Uh, don't Believe a Word. <laughs> Waiting for an Alibi. <laughs> Rosalie Cowgirl Song. Oh, it's live performance now. Cold sweat. Thunder and lightning. Out in the fields with Gary Moore. I wonder if Derwin Kirby knows about that. Anyway, that's the Thin Lizzy. Whatever happened to them? I guess they just uh, vanished. One hit wonders, baby. Well, that's the way it goes. Although, I'll tell you, the hockey uh, crowd. Oh, yeah. What are you saying, oh, yeah? When the season you, starts, they right. play that in all the hockey rooms. I, I the know. Boys that's are why back you started. Town, baby. Always that's about exactly that. why I started playing. How about those Panthers? Oh! Beat the Rangers right there in New York 4-2 last night. According to Clarence, they're playing the Rangers again tonight, which they're not. They're playing the Devils in Jersey at the Meadowlands. There will be about 15 people for that game. The Devils don't draw flies. They have a very good team. They win the Stanley Cup a lot. But uh, nobody has any injury. I mean, if you were in Jersey, would you even want to admit it? You know? Have you ever been in Jersey? Newark. Ooh. Just to Man. catch the plane, you know. Woo! You ever been in Trenton? I told you that story about WBUD in Trenton. Did you? The mad professor hired me to be the program director, and I went out and I tried to find a place, an apartment, you know? Mm-hmm. Couldn't find one. Well, actually, I did find one. It was like uh, one of those deals, in uh, like a room in somebody's house, some old lady, you know? It looked like a scene from um, Great Expectorations. Mm-hmm. By the way, what was wrong with Ethan Hawke in Great Expectations? That was a pretty good flick. I like that. I don't know if in I fact, saw it. In fact, Robert De Niro was in there, too, wasn't he? Didn't he die on the subway? I don't know if I saw it. Get out of here. Now, what about uh, Mean Creek? I'm really very uh, reluctant to put that on the air. Oh, it's over with. Oh, no. Just you mean to say well. we missed that uh, crappy ending? No, actually, it's, it's kind of a fun movie. It's okay. You know, and they're, uh, gonna, they're, they take that chubby, uh, annoying kid who's uh, hassling all the other kids in school, and they take him out there, and they're going to do harm to him. They didn't intend to kill him, to drown him, but uh, come to find out he can't swim. Mm-hmm. He drowned in it. And oh, then what? they bury his body, and then we're waiting to find out what the fallout is, and then the movie ends. Oh, we ran out of film. Don't yeah. you think that must be the, the problem in a lot of these movies? They just ran out of film? That's the impression you get. And they like, just can't afford to send somebody yeah. out to buy any mold. We just ran out of money, this is it. Send it makes to you want to play Paul Simon and Coda Chrome. You know, I, don't, I got that here somewhere. I know you do. So what do you think of my uh, idea? Are you going to pay the bonus that we're not going to be getting? Yeah. Not optional for some of us. What are you talking about? The bonus money that we're not going to be getting is. You think we won't be number one playing oldies? No. You have so little confidence. (laughs) Although we would be playing better oldies than the other ones do. Rick Shaw is probably promoting us on his show on Magic. You'll be playing a lot better crap than that uh, PD of theirs, Bob Hamilton. I keep trying to play a song and you you won't let the jingle end. Oh, okay. In other words, you want an oldies jingle? Yeah, man. Well, how about a better one than that? Let's see. Just one more. Hey, they're all good. W-I-O-D. W-I-O-D. Oh, that's it? 
I thought they were going to say Miami or something. You're not playing Kodachrome by Paul Salmon, are you? Well, anymore? since you mentioned it. Oh. Yeah, I do like this song. What's well, not to like? Unless you're anti-semantic. Not me. So it's Art, how's Art Garfunkel doing? Still has a big nose. Oh, wait a minute. Remember this golden castle. <laughs> what the hell was that? <laughs> That's on there. <laughs> I didn't do that. That's just on there. Oh, man, are you sick or what? Yeah, I remember that golden castle. So do I. It wasn't that long ago. Joy 107. Remember that? Yeah. I remember Joy Martell. I used to call Craig Worthing 15 times a show. Oh, well, those were the days, man. 6 Miami. 6 Oh, doobie doobie doobie. Here's a little jazz uh, crap for you. Mel Torme is rolling in his grave. On his How's Ella doing? Ella hits zero. I bet you Blind Mike is rubbing his radio right now. He's so excited. We got now. And it's getting bigger, too. It's like a wallet. Oh, remember I played this for Rick Shaw when he called that last time. The Wacker Tour. Everybody's doing the WCW and the Wacker Tour. Yeah, might as well turn the clock back, you know, and uh, change QM sports time. We're going to go like back, real back in time. We got 1,140 votes on the poll. There's your idiotic president. We have a responsibility. Yeah, we sure do, to cut the crap. Humans are stripping nature at an unprecedented rate and will need two planets worth of natural resources every year by 2050 on current trends, the WWF Conservation Group said this week. Populations of many species, from fish to mammals. Don't eat those fish, by the way. They're loaded with mercury. It's like a trip through the universe, man. From mercury to Uranus. From fish to mammals had fallen by about a third from 1970 to 2003, largely because of human threats such as pollution, clearing of forest, and overfishing. Overfishing. For more than 20 years, we've exceeded the Earth's ability to support a consumptive lifestyle that's unsustainable, and we can't afford to continue down this path, WWF Director General James Leap said, launching the WWF's 2006 Living Planet Report. If everyone around the world lived as those people in America, we'd need five planets to support us, Leap said. Uh, he's an American, by the way. He said in Beijing. He's pandering with the Chinese. People in the lived as those people in America. We'd need five planets to support us, Leap said. Uh, he's an American, by the way. He said in Beijing. He's pa pandering with the Chinese. People in the United Arab Emirates were placing most stress per capita on the planet ahead of those in the U.S., Finland, and Canada, the report said. How do you like that? In the United mm -hmm. Arab Emirates, those schmata heads. Australia was also living way beyond its means, crikey. The average Australian uses 6.6 .6 global hectares to support their developed lifestyle, ranking behind the U.S. and Canada, but ahead of the U.K., Russia, China, and Japan. Japan is a small country. Yeah. With a lot of people. I don't understand yeah. that. Holland is a small country with, uh, I don't know, some people. If the rest of the world lead the kind of lifestyles we do here in Australia, we require three and a half times to provide the resources we use and absorb the waste, said Greg Bourne, WWF Aussie Chief Executive Officer. Isn't it amazing that I guess everybody's got to make a living, you know? But sure. All these... Uh, different organizations and these think tanks and, uh, well, whatever the hell these are. The WWF Australia Chief Executive Officer. As countries work to improve the well-being of their people, they risk bypassing the goal of sustainability, said Leap, speaking in an energy-efficient building at Beijing's prestigious Tsinghua University. I'm Tsinghua. I see. It's inevitable that this disconnect will eventually limit the abilities of poor countries. That, that's why I wonder why are we having such a big celebration about hitting 300 million the other day. Well, what's the big simis with that? I don't know why we're, we're celebrating. celebrating that. And who the hell is he talking to the Chinese about? they got a billion Chinese over there. They were, for a long time, they're reproducing like rabbits, like cockroaches. And now all of a sudden, well, if you have more than two children, are going to, like, uh, slice your balls off or whatever they do. What do they do? They uh, throw the kid in the river. 1150 on the dial. What is that, 1150? Is that KMOX? I don't know what that is. Once, once you get past um, the tens, I get very confused. You know, 1130, uh, mm -hmm. 11, I don't know what any of those are. 1040, I think. Wasn't that um, KXEL in Waterloo, Iowa? 10.30 was WBC in Boston. 10.20 was KDKA in Pittsburgh. 10.10 was WINS. Wins 10.10 New York. And also CFRB Toronto. 10.50 was also WS Chum, CHUM. Bet you didn't know that. Nope. You better start learning your Toronto radio stations, mister. Ask me how many times I've turned the radio on since I've been here. How many times have you turned the radio on? Oh! 
You I don't. don't. I want a radio up there. Yeah, I got a radio in the other room. Uh, and actually, I did turn on a couple of times. And? I think very long time ago, maybe like four years ago during the Leafs playoffs, I wanted to hear Joe Bowen doing the game on the radio while I was watching it on TV. I mean, who the hell wants to watch old Bob Cole? You know, he doesn't even know what city they're in anymore. Hey, uh, Coley, time to hang it up, sweetheart. Halloween, uh, Halloween is, that's our poll today, 1,150 votes, fun, 491. Let's change our call letters to WFUN. <laughs> is it available? Huh? I, I doubt it. Why, you think that's, uh, didn't we just talk about that the other day? Yeah, we did. Let's see, WFUN, them all around. somebody's got them. WFUN. Halloween is fun, 491, only for little kids, 318, annoying, 118, stupid, 77, a waste of time, 56, as in Q, 56. Didn't you find that, like, vaguely interesting, that whole history, even though it was, uh, like, disjointed, a lot of mistakes? It was interesting. It was boring. A waste of time, 56. I hate this poll, 37, 3.2%. 37 malcontents. They don't like anything we do. Screw them. Witchcraft, 33. That's what it's all about, witches. It's about the uh, witches on a broomstick. You know where they're going to stick them to, don't you? No. And Dangerous 26. It's a dangerous holiday, especially when you put that razor blade in the apple. The biggest name. The best talent. This is Neil Rogers. Sports Radio 560. Or Arsene. A.M. Damn it! And now a message from AAA, the African Adoption Association. To Africa and get the baby. Unless you are a middle income, average, everyday American family, we don't give you the baby, but we do give one to Sting. The line to get the baby from Africa is currently 22 years long, much like the line to get on El Toro at Six Flags. Unless you are Jennifer Aniston, then you can use the celebrity drive through window and order up whatever you need. Come to Africa, where the weather is hot and dry, and the babies don't hardly cry, probably because we give them the camel milk, which seems to quiet them. It's easy to get a baby in Africa, unless you are an average Simba or Mufasa, or in your country, how you say, Dick or Jane. But if you are Lisa Gibbons, Deborah Novel, or Tempest Bledsoe, it's no problem. Come to Africa, where some people question why we only give babies to famous people, and everyone else has to wait until their eyes fall out. We say this to you, it's a business. Let's say you are an accountant. You would much rather have the business of meatloaf than, say, Ralph from Kearney, New Jersey. See? That's okay. Come to Africa, Clayton. Come to Africa, Lance Bass. Come to Africa, Jim McGreevy. Come to Africa, drummer of band cutting crew. We give you the baby. No questions asked. But if you're not famous, the line for the baby starts in Portugal. And please. No cutting in line, or we shoot you. This has been a message from the AAA, the African Adoption Association. Yeah, we could do QM oldies time is 11.20. There you go. Yeah, than QM sports time? Uh, anything would be. But you know me, I'm biased. Yeah. You're just the anti-sports. That's what Vogue Camper said. Uh-huh. You're the evildoer, man. You're the anti-sports room in there. You're brainwashing uh, Josh and anybody else who comes anywhere near there. <laughs> this is what I say. Remember this golden cancer. There's Michael J. Fox, the uh, hypermetallism again, bouncing around. Wonderful, WQAM. Here's my story, it's sad but true. It's about a girl that I once knew. Big girl for pride, big girl for pride. 
You know, when you come right down to it, I did like their music, but how could anybody think about Frankie Valley and keep a straight face, you know, when you come right down to it? I don't know. Kind of a silly guy. Oh, there's Michael J. Fox on there again. He's like, uh, now, do you think he's really doing that or is Rush right? Oh, he's an actor, you know. <laughs> oh, maybe he popped a couple of oxys before he went on stage. 1,171 votes on the poll, man. We got, uh, I don't know, the sky's the limit today. I'm not even coming up with a number. Whatever. K sera sera, as Doris Day would say. We're not playing no Doris Day music. Now, you want to know what the best decade was for uh, music? Okay. See, you won't agree with me, but I'm, I'm going to no. tell you right now. You're going to say the 70s, and I'm going to say the 60s. I'm not going to argue with that. I don't want to choose. Oh, no. Not Jimmy Gilmer in the uh, fireball. The Uncle Sugar Show. Oh, there's a crazy little shack beyond the tracks. Wasn't I just yesterday made some caustic comment about Jan and Dean? They couldn't sing their way out of a paper sack, something like that? Some comment. Two girls for every mm. oh. Ow. Oh, oh, you can't say Woody. You can say Woody Graber, but you sure as hell can't say Woody. You can say Woody Hayes. Anyway, can we move along now? Although I think it's a great idea. What do you say? Let's give it a shot. What do you say, Josh? Gosh, you're going to pay the bonus. All right. What do you mean if I'm going to pay the bonus? I mean, it's not that much anyway, but I can't afford to be without it. Maybe yours ain't that much. Mine yeah, could well. cover like uh, several bad days at Woodbine. <laughs> oh, God. Here comes the bunny, and there goes your money, baby. Just keep shoving it in that machine. Just very sad. Sad deal. But you know something? It's only money. And one thing you'll discover when you get to be an old fart like me, if you make it that long, is that uh, what difference does it make? You know, when you got a few bucks stashed away, and of course, by the time you get to be this age, you'll be loaded with cash. Once you sell those naked pictures of Clarence with a billy goat, oh, if only. That's got to be it. He, he, he's got to have naked pictures of somebody. Oh, I know what I should play. Don't tell me River Phoenix was Jewish and he's dead. Is that what you tell me? I didn't know Still he was dead? Jewish. I beg your pardon? I didn't know he was Jewish. Well, his uh, brother is, uh, what, what's his brother's name? Joaquin. Phoenix Phoenix. When the night has come. Don't you remember we uh, looked up those Jews? And the land is dark. And the moon. That's yeah, when I, I was all obsessed with James Franco, and I apologize again for that. I just don't know what the hell I was thinking about. It's your fault. I'm sorry. And what's that movie, Flyboys? Correct. Don't bother. Is it out yet? What do you mean, oh, don't yeah, bother? You've seen it? The theater. Yeah, I saw it in the movies. For and some it reason. sucked? It was weak. It was very typical, formulaic, no surprises. Holy moly, look at this. Chip in Jersey says, I just got back from a week in Jersey, New York, and Connecticut. I lived in Tenafly and Englewood, New Jersey in 61 as a kid. I've been in both places. My roommate from Michigan State was uh, from Tenafly, New Jersey. Had never gone back until this trip. The area of this state is great and beautiful. I was very surprised to see how little Tenafly has changed over 45 years. How little it's changed, except, of course, for the types of people living there. Many Asians and Indians, but that only makes for a more diverse community like Toronto, right, it says? I don't know whether Chip's being sarcastic or what. You're being sarcastic, I, I, I Chip? sarcastic. No, he's not. I What's wrong smell. with Asians and Indians? Oh, get out of here now. The, the sarcasm. smell of what? The sarcasm. Dripping you can off smell it? Facts. Yeah. Maybe that's that curry thing again. You're picking on the uh, people from India again. How okay. many people from India do you know? Three, I was at Wuhan yesterday, man, and there was a group of uh, Indian people. I'm talking not. I'm not talking about uh, right. Native uh, Canadians or uh, Americans. Right. I'm talking about Indian people from India, real Indians. I've known about four that were friends. Uh, and it was one guy, like special. in his early twenties. And I'm going to tell you, I would have dropped that machine right there. What I what I lost yesterday, I would have been more than happy to shovel right into his pocket if he would like, you know, come over here for a couple hours for about twenty minutes. Wow. I'm serious. There's like a lot of beautiful Indian people. You just don't think about it that much. I mean, there's a billion people there, so they got to be somewhere pretty hot. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. So anyway, I don't know what you're talking about, Chip. But now maybe Chip is being uh, serious, you know. I don't know. He's a chip off the old block. Or maybe a chip off the old jock here on sports radio where a sports time is 26 past 11. <laughs> New Jersey is a horrendous place. I mean, I'm not saying that Tenafly or Englewood are all that bad. They're like little uh, bedroom towns, you know. But the only thing good about New Jersey is it's close to New York if uh, you like New York. Uh-oh. Get... Better not do that again, George. The biggest names, the best talents. This is Ian Rogers. Sports Radio 560 QAM. The biggest names, the best talents. What was that? This is Ian Rogers. Sports Radio 560 QAM. Oh, God. Coming soon to a theater near you.
the sequel to See, The Indian that game. Cupboard Thank you. is Indian in the Blender. Oh! What? No! No! Oh, no! 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 The Indian in the Blender. <laughs> They're hopping in the time machine. Oh, wow. Won't you come along and see? No. Here's the golden banker from WQAM. Right now. Oh, my God. Jimmy Clanton is doing this in Luigi. I guess that's a good place to take this show on, isn't it? I'm you. I'm at you. Oh, and if that isn't good enough, a medley of this right. match, Gene Chandler. Woo! I'll tell you who I really liked a lot, but I couldn't figure out which one of them I liked the best. And this is hardly one of their big hits, but that's what I got right now. Everly Brothers? Don and Phil, the Everly Brothers. I like them both, and I can't figure out which one. And they're old and crusty right now, I'm sure, and well used. 1,198 votes. Boy, if I refresh that again, I bet you we got 1,200 here on. It's 11.32 QM sports time, by the way. If you're wondering what that sports time is all about, so are we. We're beginning to wonder. 11.99. Boy, we're right on the precipice of greatness, right on the edge. Speaking of that, wait till you hear this. British surgeons were yesterday given the final go-ahead to perform the world's first full face transplant. Are you going to start again with the face transplant people? Well, are you back in that facial crap again? No, that woman, the poor woman that got the face transplant you made. So much I fun haven't said a word. Oh. I'm just reading the story, okay? I'm just Heartless. passing it along. I'm passing How gas is... and passing along the story. The world's four, uh, first full trace of flan plant. A radical procedure that's raised concerns about its physical and psychological risks. The UK face transportation t- transplantation team at the <laughs> Royal Free Hospital in London received permission for four transplants from the hospital's research ethics committee. We can now begin to evaluate patients and drop a short list of four people who want to undergo this procedure, said Peter Butler, the plastic and reconstruction surgeon who head the team. Now, if we could have a face and a body transplant, then I'm all for that. I don't want to look like Luke Christie. Though. I don't want to sound like Luke Christie. I don't want to... Although I do like Lou Christie. I don't want my heart to show. Bad face. Two faces have we will continue to take a cautious and careful approach. We'll not be rushed, they said. It may be many more months before we're ready to carry out an operation. They can start with the royal family, since this is a Brit thing. They can start on the old queen. Not this old queen, but that one. And uh, Charles and Camilla, too. Speaking of donkey face. The Ethics Committee said it reached its decision after carefully reviewing a decade of research results by Butler and his team. Groundbreaking research is always difficult. There will always be doubters and detractors, said Andrew Way, the chief executive of the hospital. But he added that many people with severe injuries desperately need help, and the transplantation team at the hospital has got an international reputation. A face transplant. They give good face in Britain. I didn't say good facials, you know this. I, I I'm refreshing it, and it's a 1208. Oh, that's... Got it made in the shade. I just got you playing it. I'll tell you who I liked a lot during that British invasion was the Knickerbockers, and probably ought to be the QM theme song, at least when Greg Reed. What word did you say? Wow, what the hell did I just say? Oh, Knickerbockers. Yeah. How come that's not in here? I thought that lies was in here. It's not in here. We've got like a glam, which is grammatically incorrect. I thought for sure lies was in here by the Nicky Well, there it is. I have it. Yeah, you got it all right. How are you going to get rid of it? Oh, I know what's in here. Speaking of Greg, liar, liar, pants on fire. George was telling me yesterday that Greg is hanging around the building a lot, Greg Reed, and we're not too happy about it. At least George said he wasn't too happy about it. I couldn't sleep at all last night. Anyhow, QM Sports Times 24 till noon. We could just play oldies and moldies all day for what, about two years? Let me hang in there with Manfred Mann. I beg your pardon? need closure on that song. There she was, 
just walking down the street singing. That's enough. All right. This is a story about one T-shirt that's caused two rows already. The shirt has the phrase, We will not be silent, written both in English and in Arabic. <laughs> this may seem innocuous enough, but not in today's America, where the very sight of Arabic alarms some citizens, as well as Homeland Security get all whipped up. Oh, my God. Right. On August 12th, Reed Gerard, Raid, Raid, Raid Gerard, who works for Global Exchange in Washington, D.C., was wearing a T-shirt as he was trying to board a JetBlue flight from JFK to California. While he was at the gate eating some cheese and grapes and drinking some orange juice, two men approached him and one flashed his badge, Gerard writes on his blog, Raid in the middle dot blogspot dot com, R-A-E-D. They asked for his boarding pass and driver's license. You think it's red in the middle? People are feeling offended because of your T-shirt, said one of the men whom Gerard identifies as Inspector Harris. He asked me if I had any other T-shirts to put on. I told him I had checked in all of my bags, Gerard relates on the blog. I asked him, why do you want me to take my T-shirt off? Isn't it my constitutional right to express myself in this way? Do you have an order against Arabic T-shirts? Is there such a law against Arabic script? Here's what Inspector Harris said, according to Gerard. You can't wear a T-shirt with Arabic script and come to an airport. It's like wearing a T-shirt that reads, I am a robber and going to a bank. Oh, mm. cracker, please. How do you like that? Harris asked Gerard to turn his shirt inside out, which he says he refused to do. Then an employee from JetBlue offered to buy Gerard a T-shirt to put over the one he had on. Not wanting to miss his flight, Gerard eventually agreed. He says he told the inspector and JetBlue employee, I feel very sad that my personal freedom was taken away like this. I grew up under authoritarian governments in the Middle East, and one of the reasons I chose to move to the U.S. was that I don't want an officer make me change my freaking T-shirt. I'll pursue this incident today through a constitutional rights organization. You go, Gerard. When he boarded the plane, he says he wasn't allowed to sit in seat 3A, which was on his boarding pass and which he had chosen over the Internet. Instead, Jeff Blue moved him to the very back of the plane. It sucks to be an Arab Muslim living in the U.S. these days, he says on his blog. You're a suspected terrorist and a plane hijacker. Jeff Blue, for its part, explains its side of the story. Mr. Gerard was approached both by TSA and JetBlue personnel because they saw that customers in the area had noticed his T-shirt and were confused or concerned about it, said spokesperson Jenny Durvin. In that situation, our crew members have the responsibility to create a safe environment as well as safe travel. If there's anything that upsets or confuses our customers, our crew members have to address them. At the same time, they have to respect the rights of the individual and make sure that he's treated fairly and respectively. I'm sure they mean respectfully, but it says respectively. JetBlue personnel approached Mr. Gerard and explained that customers were concerned or confused and asked if he could ease the confusion. Ball of confusion, baby. Coming right at up. No, at no time was he ever denied boarding. See, why do I even do that? You know, because you're so, it's just impossible. At no time was he ever denied boarding. He did agree to put another T-shirt on, which we purchased for him, which we really appreciated. Nevertheless, JetBlue says it told Gerard, sorry. We have apologized to Mr. Gerard for any embarrassment or unnecessary attention he may have caused, Durbin said. Gerard, who couldn't be reached by the progressive, spoke to Amy Goodman, October 23rd. Sounds like the temptations to me. It is. Balls of confusion. Anyway, he told uh, Amy that he's taken legal steps with the ACLU and the, Arab anti -American, uh, the uh, American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee. He also reports he's received death threats. On his blog, he quotes from a National Guard member who served in Iraq. If I run across you in my daily tasks, I will kill you, says the message. Get the F out of my country if you don't like it here. How do you like that? Mm -hmm. Stephanie Schwartz goes to Hunter College in New York, and she was also wearing a We Will Not Be Silent t-shirt October 9 when she was going on the Staten Island ferry. Bye, she told Amy Goodman that once she got on the ferry, four Coast Guard officers positioned themselves in front of her. When she was leaving, one of them told her, You better not wear that shirt on this ferry again, she said, adding that he asked, You remember what happened on that jet blue flight? Schwartz said she answered that it smacked of racial profiling there. It smacked like smack. When Gerard heard that the Coast Guard invoked his experience with JetBlue, he was taken aback. He told Amy Goodman, I'm very shocked to see how my incident, my oppression of JFK, is being used as a precedent to justify oppressing more people. The Coast Guard gives a different account. Coast Guard officers were approached by an employee of the ferry who had concerns about the shirt, but their response to that employee was that they weren't going to take any action, says Commander Jeff Carter. They had no intention of intervening. She had every right to wear the shirt. Concerned about our civil liberties, Schwartz organized a protest at the Staten Island Ferry October 23rd. You ferry! According to the newspaper, the Staten Island Advance, a group of nearly 100 anti-war activists, mostly wearing black T-shirts with the legend, We Will Not Be Silent, boarded two evening ferry boats to exercise their right of free speech. You go, boys. We'll be way behind you. Not right behind you, way behind you. Don't forget, tomorrow's a good day to show up for work. Ice cream and wieners from uh, Jackson's and Dane. No way. For George and Josh. See, there's another good reason for me not to be there. That's right. Because I do love Jackson's, and that's the problem. I would eat like a whole... And, you know, they, they serve those big concoctions, you know? Yes, they do. I was going to say I could eat a whole bucket full of their 
fantastic stuff. You know, like those wild Sundays that they make? Mm-hmm. But I won't be there. So you, you eat some extra for me. I will. I'm sure you will. And then after the jingle, then you can make some of the stones yourself, like for real, in real life. No doubt. 19 till noon is QM Sports Time. And the good news is it's Donna Mattress' 30th birthday. I, I just can't resist when it's a birthday, you know? Yeah, I got the check. <laughs> got the carpet. It's my birthday. It's my own birthday. New chair, right? Geico. Real service. Real savings. It's my birthday. Happy birthday to our friends at Donna Mattress' 30th birthday. Oh, Susan Goldstein, pronounced Goldstein, is not Jewish as a fact. Her husband is. Oh. And the same race her opponent, Martin uh, Kier's name. So who cares about that? Oh, somebody has some corrections, it says here. Well, correct my ass. How do you like that? Is some that corrections. Line? Knit pickers. The only thing worse than a knit picker is a nose picker. God, go back and knit a sweater. Susan Weinstein. Steen. Yeah. Who cares? Quit using Damarino's likeness, okay, Susan? And she's not Jewish anyway, so she's not a sellout. She's just using his uh, likeness. Dollar Mattress is 30th birthday, and to celebrate, Dollar Mattress and Simmons are offering the lowest price of the year on best-selling Simmons Beauty Rest Pillow Top. You can choose from South Florida's biggest selection of Simmons Beauty Rest with same-day delivery. If you're finally ready for a good night's sleep, not just tonight, but like for years to come, do what I've been doing for a long time. Call Dollar Mattress at 1-800-MATTRESS. Just sit in the, uh, on your fat ass. That's all you have to do. Make that easy call to get factory direct prices, award-winning service with no nonsense, no BS, no rip-offs, no off-brands, no games. Dollar Mattress gives you 12-month financing, and when you call Dollar Mattress, they deliver when you want them to. You pick the date and time for delivery any day, seven days a week, from 8 in the a.m. till 10 p.m., and they show up even the very same day that you call. In other words, if you call right now, you can be sleeping like a baby on a great Dollar Mattress as soon as tonight. That's why Dollar Mattress continues to be ranked number one in the world in customer satisfaction and why all of us at QAM use Dollar Mattress. On the web, check them out at dollarmattress.com or make that one easy call. Just sit there on their fat, ugly, pimply ass and call 1-800-MATTRESS. 1-800-M-A-T-T-R-E-S. Leave off the last as because it stands for Sensational Stupendous Savings. The biggest names of best talent. This is Neil Rogers. Go, 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 go. Force Radio 560 QAM. Congressman Martoli gave me a goose on my side. My side. Said he wanted to give me some kisses too. On my side. My side. Martoli told me he would take me out of Botswana. Stayed a moral Republican. Man of honor. He knew I'm just a kid, but he put his hands and lips on my thigh. You fell. Like, he asked my opinion of what I like or not. Do you like it better on the bottom or top? And while you take a little time to decide, he said, Here comes Chunky, open wide. I like the fine young man who places soft and smooth hands on my thigh. My thigh. All the chat room dudes I want stuck like glue on my thigh. Oh, I was molested as a boy, and I'm a heavy drinker. There's a plausible ploy. Hey, ain't I a thinker? I knew I made it as a page when a hand was placed on my thigh. Once again, I won't delay or say nay to a page whose hand is placed on my thigh. To us, Gary. Come on, you can do it. Well, open what, your. What I want to know is. I beg your pardon. I was talking it up. I said, "I want." What I want to know is, and then he answered. See how clever that was. Like I said, who's going to pay my bonus? <laughs> Ernie Maresca. Huh? Here he goes with that Italian stuff again. She plucked the banana right up the old shoe, Ernie. Another one hit wonder, Ernie Maresca. Too much mascara on that. Look at that. One, two, three, four. We got 1,234 votes on the poll. Can you believe that? It's not even noon yet. And we've topped the 1,200 mark. It's not even noon yet. Jesus, K. Christ. 
Of course, it's a pretty easy pull. I mean, anybody doesn't have an opinion about Halloween. It's, you know, some stuffed shirt. What's wrong with Halloween? Or huh? some foreigner, like maybe from Arabia, wearing one you of those shirts. You don't think Muslims celebrate uh, Halloween? I doubt it. <laughs> it's witchcraft. I notice you still haven't played that, have you? You know, I don't have it. I'm going to have to go find it. I've got a lot of Sinatra in here. I don't want to hear no it. Witchcraft. I don't want to hear no Sinatra. Okay? Oh, you're gonna... I don't want to hear no Swanky Frankie. That's for the real oldie moldies. Oh, my God. Peggy Lee and Frank Sinatra. And maybe a little Al Martino. Remember Al Martino? Sure. You can act like a man. What can I do? Halloween is fun, say 530 of you. Only for the kids, little kids, 337. Yeah, if you're like Mark Foley, if you're an adult, if you're like 52 years old, probably mm -hmm. not a good idea running around knocking on neighborhood doors. Trick or treat. Uh -huh. Like that. Annoying, 129. Stupid, 83. A waste of time, 56. I hate this pool, only 40. It's witchcraft, 36, and dangerous, 26. Now, who are the people that are always uh, yelling about it's witchcraft and it's uh, the cat is uh, this and uh, all that crap? The Christians. The Christians? The God Squad? You're talking about the, the people Jesus that Christers? have a problem with it? The people that want a Halloween outlawed? That right. That anyone who dresses up or Christers? goes trick-or-treating or gives I'll candy to children? I bet you that the overwhelming the... majority of people are going to be uh, trick-and-treating and, and uh, Halloweening it up and uh, all that other stuff. I bet you they're glam. Mm-hmm. So what are you talking about? The born again, the fundamentalist, it's yeah. evil, it's Satan's holiday. Are you Anyone trying to say the Getchkeys? Is that yes, what you're going to try to yes. say? Yes. What, what I mean to say is... Yes, yes! Heavy mobile use damages sperm. <laughs> Not really. Uh, heavy use of mobile phones may damage men's fertility. If you'd have just talked another couple hours on the phone. It's like, well, where are they putting it? Rectum. Researchers found those men who used a phone for four hours or more a day had fewer sperm than those that had they had moved. Four hours? Four hours or more a day had fewer sperm, and those they had moved less well and were of poorer quality. Those they had moved less well. In other words, they don't swim good. The Ohio study involved 364 men presented to the American Society for Reproductive Medicine in New Orleans, but a U.K. expert said it was unlikely the phones were to blame as they were in use and not near the testes, and it may be that being sedentary was the cause. Unless you put your phone in your lap when you're talking, you know, that's probably not a good idea. Yeah, I think their other theory is more accurate. The team from the Cleveland Clinic Foundation in Ohio tested the sperm of 364 men who were being treated at fertility clinics in Mumbai, India, with their partners. There we go again with India. It used to be Bombay, now it's Mumbai. Why did they keep changing the names of cities, you know, that, and countries, and Christ? That's the British uh, fault. It was found that the heaviest users, those who used their phones for more than four hours a day, had the lowest average sperm counts at 50 million per millimeter and the least healthy sperm. Men who use their phones for between two and four hours a day averaged sperm counts of 69 million per a milli, um, uh, milliliter and had modestly, moderately healthy sperm. Those who said they didn't use mobile phones at all had the highest average sperm counts, 86 million per millimeter, and their sperm was of the highest quality seen. I didn't know you could see them, but that's what it says here, highest quality seen, unless maybe Can't under a microscope. Him. Yeah, they're crawling around on the wall. Dr. Ashok Argawal, who led the research, told the New Orleans conference the study didn't prove uh, mobile's damaged fertility, but said it showed more research was warranted. There was a significant decrease in the most important measures of sperm health, and that should definitely be reflected in the decrease in fertility, which is seen worldwide. But you know something? That's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Right. Because the world is badly overpopulated. Zero population. ZPG ought to be real happy about that. They ought to give everybody a free cell phone and say, hey, uh, put this in your lap. Yeah. Lap it. Stick it on your shorts. People use mobile phones without thinking twice what the consequences might be. They said it's just like having a toothbrush, but mobiles could be having a devastating effect on fertility. Thank God. Stop making all these unwanted babies, okay? I mean, how many kids is Madonna going to adopt after all? How many you got? It still has to be proved, but it could be having a huge impact because mobiles are so much part of our lives. I bet you your BlackBerry don't cause no one of these things. Not the way I use it, no. He suggested radiation from mobile phones might harm sperm. Why, you have a BlackBerry? No, it's just uh, similar. Well, what does that mean? It does other things besides uh, being a phone. Yeah, well, so does mine. So yeah, it's right. similar. Yeah. Yes. Does it uh, give you Internet access? Browse, yes. Oh. Email, brother. Internet I'll tell you, yeah. it's a good thing I lost that BlackBerry. That's Text. the best. One of the luckiest things that ever happened to me in my life was losing the BlackBerry at Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam. So that I had to get the brand new one, you know? Right. The old, the old one was the original model, man. It was slower than a Model T for it. It was just pathetic. Going online on that thing would be like trying to get a clear signal on this station. Impossible. <laughs> Although we are in stereo. He suggested radiation from mobile phones might harm sperm by damaging DNA, affecting the cells in the testes, which produce testosterone, or the tubes where sperm is produced. Tube! But a British expert cast down on the suggested link between mobile phone use and infertility in the men studied. Dr. Alan Pacey, senior lecturer in andrology at the University of Sheffield, said, This is a good study, but I don't think it tackles the issue. 
If you're using your phone for four hours a day, presumably it's out of your pocket for longer. That raises a big question. How is it that testicular damage is supposed to occur? Dr. Pacey, who's honorary second, that, that's a very good question. I mean, if you got it in your pocket, you know, right. if you're the old pocket rocket, Dr. Pacey, who's honorary secretary of the British Fertility Society, and if you're holding it up to your head to speak a lot, it makes no sense that it's having a direct effect on your testes, unless, of course, your testes are connected to your head. <laughs> well, in some people's yeah. cases. Okay. He added that people who use phones for longer might be more sedentary, more stressed, or eat more junk food, which might be more likely explanation for the link found in the study. More of that junk food, more sitting around on your arse. Good, do that and quit making so many unwanted babies, for Christ's sakes. George, <laughs> crying out Pardon? loud. Although I will say this, when you eat that gallon of ice cream tomorrow from Jackson's, that'll probably be helpful. To you do what? Blood sugar up to about 700. Oh, yeah, know. to make me uh, fat. It's helpful that you're sure. eating it and not me. It's a damn good thing I'm not there, because I can't resist. You know me and ice cream. I know. We scream, we scream. How's that go? We all scream for ice cream? 1,254 votes as we reach the top of the hour. Boy, this is scandalous. That's more listeners than they got midday across the street in six weeks. You know what? And don't forget, speaking of that, speaking of across the street, QAM Sports Time is 11.56. The biggest names, the best It's all sports radio in case you haven't ordered. How about those three teams? QAM. Well, uh, it be the 12 to 1 hour on WQAM. All right. Look at who that is. Everybody look at who that is. Lordy, Lordy, look at who that is. Danny Wins, he wins. He's a racing wins. Race around in his car, that is. The race driver that never wins. Danny Wins, he wins. Mm-hmm. Now see here, all you kids. They call me Mr. Wins. One day soon, I'll win a race. In my rocket, 88. Oh, well, uh, hey, baby. You show sure look fine today. Oh, uh-huh, Mr. Ribbs, did you win the race? Oh, well, I came in at 35th place. Well, you earned yourself some ribs on the plate. Forget that, honey. Mm, how's about a date? Uh-huh, I ain't gonna take that chance. Mm-hmm. Not if you keep coming in last. Is that why you don't go out with me? You ain't too slow. You can't compete. Well, I may be slow on the street, but I shall be fast on my feet. He's still dead? All over the world. Yes. And in every port, I own the heart of at least one lovely girl. I'm dying on the hair. a very underrated group, the Hollies. I don't know by whom, but I just think generally speaking, if you talk about, you know, really good groups from uh, that era, who the hell would ever bring up the Hollies? I would. Well, maybe you would, but that's, you know. Love the Hollies. Because, yeah, I love the Hollies, too, but they're underrated. You don't think they're underrated? Uh, a lot of people don't talk about them, yes. So. <laughs> yeah. I guess I that's it. highly overrated, although I don't know by whom. Oh, I can't handle it. Gordon Lightfoot, I don't want to, you know. Too Canadian. What the hell is that? I changed the track, but it's playing the same damn thing. Oh, here it is. Speaking of Robbie Benson, he's still Jewish, by the way. Was it third of June? Another sleepy, dusty, the day. Shouldn't have been doing them things in that circus tent, Robbie. I was with a man. Oh, no wonder Del Shannon killed himself. Why? Runaway 67. This would do it. Yeah. Oh, my God. Don't, don't do it. 
Oh. <laughs> Me too. Del Shannon on Doggy Downers, folks. Whoa. I'll tell you why I still like, although I think he probably can't sing as out of a paper sack. Every now and then they appear somewhere like down there. Boy, he was good. He may have had the best voice of anybody, you know, even better than Jim Morrison, even better than, like, uh, Bobby Lewis. This magic moment. You don't think? No argument. So different so different Asking a musical question, was Jay Black? I bet you he was Jewish. Most Not. of them. Parts of him were Jewish. 1,267 black. votes on the poll. Parts of him were black, like his hair. Heather Wakash, who the hell is she? What kind of a name is that anyway? I know I'm, I'm, I'm butchered these names. You know what? I don't really care. She's author of the Progressive's Handbook, Get the Facts and Make a Difference Now. Okay? This is from CommonDreams.org, and, and that does not stand for orgasm, by the way. Halliburton scored almost $1.2 billion in revenue from contracts related to Iraq in the third quarter of 2006, leading one analyst to comment, Iraq was better than expected. Overall, there's nothing really to question or be skeptical about. I think the results are very good. Very good indeed. An estimated 655,000 dead Iraqis, over 3,000 dead coalition troops, billions stolen from Iraq's coffers, a country battered by civil war. But Halliburton turned to profit, so the results are very good. Very good certainly for Vice President Dick Cheney, who resigned from Halliburton in 2000 with a $33.7 million retirement package, not bad for roughly four years of work. In a stunning conflict of interest, Cheney still holds more than 400,000 stock options in the company. Why pursue diplomacy when you can rake in a personal fortune from war? Yet Cheney isn't the only one who's benefited from the Bush administration's destructive policies. The Bush family has done quite nicely, too. Just a few examples. Bush Sr., Bush 41, George Herbert Walker, whiny George. Bush's dad has strong connections to the Carlyle Group, a massive private equity investment firm whose chairman emeritus is Frank Carlucci, former college roommate of Don Rumsfeld, and former defense secretary under Ronald Reagan. Imagine the pull Carlucci has with today's White House. He's pulling it. But Carlucci has another secret weapon, Bush Sr., Amid conflict of interest allegations, the elder Bush resigned from the Carlisle Group in 2003, but reportedly remains on retainer, opening doors to lucrative profits in the Middle East and elsewhere. Bush's specialty, this is Bush Sr., is Saudi Arabia. In fact, he was at a Carlisle investment conference with Osama bin Laden's estranged brother, Shafiq bin Laden, when the 9-11 attacks took place. Just a coincidence, you understand. Carlisle specializes in military and security investments, and with Bush Jr. in office, the company's profits have soared. It received $677 million in contracts in 2002, then a whopping $2.1 billion in 2003. Carlisle's investors currently enjoy an equity capital pool of over $44 billion. In January 2006, Bush Sr. wrote China's Foreign Affairs Ministry that it would be beneficial to the comprehensive de development of Sino-U.S. relations if Beijing approved the sale of a Chinese bank to a consortium which included Carlisle. Bluntly put, Bush Sr. asked China to grant Carlisle a lucrative business deal or risk his son's wrath, foreign policy at its finest. William H.T. Bucky Bush. George's uncle Bucky joined the Board of Military Contractor Engineered Support Systems, ESSI, in 2001. And perhaps not surprisingly, the value of the company's governmental contracts has strongly increased with Bush Jr. in Orifice. Uncle Bucky earns monthly consulting fees as well as options to buy stock at favorable prices. And considering that ESI, ESSI stock tripled two weeks after 9-11, then settled into comfy territory, it's safe to say that George's uncle is doing quite well. In fact, Bucky cashed out an 8,438 stock options in January 2005, earning himself a cool 450 grand in the process. As of last year, he still owned options of 45,000 more shares of the company's stock and accrues more each year. War is very profitable for ESSI, or as an executive explained, the increasing likelihood for a prolonged military involvement in Southwest Asia by U.S. forces well into 2006 created a fertile environment for the type of support products and services that we offer. But lest anyone conclude that Bucky has opened doors for the company, ESSI's Vice President of Investor Relations explained in 2005, the fact his nephew was in the White House has absolutely nothing to do with Mr. Bush being on our board or with our stock having gone up a 1,000% in the past five years. Absolutely nothing at all. Absolutely. Neil Mallenbush. Neil rose to infamy in the 1980s as director of the Colorado-based Silverado Savings and Loan. After Silverado collapsed due to mismanagement and corruption, U.S. taxpayers were stuck with a billion-dollar bailout, yet Neil managed to escape the crisis with a small fine and no jail time. It helps to have a dad as vice president. In 1993, Neil joined Bush Sr. in Kuwait to drum up business in the Middle East, and today makes a profit by helping companies cash in on the occupation of Iraq. For example, in late 2003, the Financial Times reported that Neil earned 60 grand a year through the Crest Investment Company, a private firm generating contracts in Iraq. 
Crest was headed by Jamal Daniel, a longtime Bush family contra- contact, who was also on the advisory board of Newbridge Strategies, a company specifically set up with the aim of assisting clients to evaluate and take advantage of business opportunities in the Middle East following the conclusion of the U.S.-led war in Iraq. In 2003, Neil's messy divorce proceedings revealed that he was to get $2 million in stock options from a Chinese semiconductor firm, despite having limited education or business experience in that area. Critics complained that the Chinese company was buying access to his brother, the president. Neil later testified that on repeated business trips to Asia, he'd had sex with women who showed up at his hotel rooms, presumably prostitutes, hired by companies trying to curry favor with the White House. Neil has also profited, of course, from Georgia's disastrous No Child Left Behind educational policy. His company, Ignite, partially owned by Bush Sr. and funded by Crest Investment, has been awarded with lucrative federal contracts to place its educational products in school districts across the country, including, of course, Florida and his good old brother, Fat Ass Jet. Mm-hmm. Marvin Pierce Bush. Marvin joined the Bush Sr. and Neil on their Middle Eastern sales trip in 1993, then made a mint in the investment banking business. He's co-founder of Winston Partners, a private investment firm whose investments in military and security firms profit from Bush's so-called war on terror. Having a sibling as president has helped Marvin in other ways, too. He's on the board of HCC Insurance Holdings, which had insured parts of the World Trade Center. HCC benefited from the 9-11 insurance bailout legislation pushed through by Brother George. Marvin was also on the board of Securicom, a company which provided electronic security for both Dulles International Airport and the World Trade Center on 9-11. Marvin stepped down in 2000, but how intriguing that Bush's brother was so well connected to the security of two critical locations on that fateful day. In short, the results are very good for the Bush dynasty, perhaps even better than expected thanks to George's stint in the Oval Office. Dad's still setting up international deals. Uncle Bucky's cashing in on stock options. Brothers Neil and Marvin are laughing all the way to the bank. It's just the American people who have paid the ultimate price. I ought to be watching that movie, you know, while we uh, fight. Yeah. yeah. But we won't. At least they won't. You think anybody's watched that movie? Well, it's the one with Ike on the cover. Remember, mm-hmm. we like Ike? We do. 1,282 votes, boy. There is no telling. There's no stopping us now, man. We're rolling it. Even yesterday and today, you do understand it's the free trial of Howard on uh, online. And if you if you click onto that deal, I checked yeah. it out earlier. They make you they an offer that one. you can refuse. They let you. They will allow you now. Serious. Will let you subscribe. Online. In other words, you don't have to go out and buy a radio. Why, why are you doing ads for them? I'm not doing ads for them. I'm being sarcastic. You're getting something uh, we don't know about? Yeah. I'm getting just like with that pasta deal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting it under the table. Uh, I only wish uh, I was getting it under uh, the table. Totally, yeah. Yeah, I wish I was back in Berlin and getting it on the table, under the table, over the table, and like Johnny and Joe would say, over the mountain and across the sea. Didn't we just play that the other day? Yeah, I don't, I don't got it. You got it. You got it all. Or I'm working on it. I still haven't figured out where the hell you got all that from, but you got it all. I bet I've you been got collecting this. for a long time. Should have played a jingle on this. Over the, doors. the mountain. Oh, no, I'd rather hear that than Raindrops by D. Clark. Cross the sea. Is that on Motown? A girl for I, I don't know. Oh, come on. I'll have to look in my book. Yes. To my older children. It doesn't seem, I mean, they weren't a Motown group, but it just seems, I'm trying to, every time we play one of these, I try to envision the label, you know? I don't know why. Why do I do that? I don't know. Maybe old fart? Old fart. It, it's like, you know, like a connection to it. Johnny and Joe. On chess. I told you it's on chess records. Give it off your chest. 12.13 is QAM Sports Time. The biggest names, the best talents. This is Neil Rogers. Sports Radio 560. QAM. Sports Radio. Florida Panthers hockey. Drop that puck. He shoots the score! <laughs> Florida Panthers face off against the New Jersey Devils at the Continental Airlines Arena. Coverage starts at 7 with Panthers preview. Driven by J.M. Lexus on Sports Radio 560 QAM. Neil Rogers. Hi. Oh. I'm dying out here. Miami has the Dolphins. And here we go again. Yes. Another losing season that's never gonna end. Uh-huh. They never win, they never will, and I will never know that's why good. Sports Illustrated picked them to win the Super Bowl. And they're the Miami Dolphins, Miami Dolphins. 
Miami Dolphins number. How many teams in the league? 32. Miami Dolphins. Miami Dolphins. The same old story, nothing new. The Dolphins are such losers. They really are quite lame. I knew it from the very start. I watched the Pittsburgh game. And did you see the wimpy way Nick Saban threw that flag? Standing on the sidelines, he looked just like a fag. And there the fair Miami Dolphins, Miami Dolphins, Miami Dolphins number. How many teams in the league? 30. About 30, Miami Dolphins, Miami Dolphins. Their problems stick to them like glue. The Dolphins lost to Buffalo and then beat Tennessee. It's only by sheer luck that they pulled out a victory. And then they played the Texans. It almost made me sick. That stupid two-point pass play. That fumbling onside kick. And they're the Miami Dolphins. Miami Dolphins. Miami Dolphins number. How many teams in the that league? That ain't so. Miami Dolphins. Miami Dolphins, Poland Omari needs new shoes. The Dolphins can't control the ball, their running game is flat. As for their execution, well, I'd agree with that. Yes. They're always gonna blow a lead of that, you can be sure. And when they leave the field, so has the stench of cow manure. And they're the Miami Dolphins. All right. Miami Dolphins. Miami Dolphins number. How many teams in the league? Miami Dolphins. Miami Dolphins. Give them another shot of blue. The Dolphins have no strategy. They play like idiots. Another couple games lost to the Patriots and Jets. I think they're all retarded. It's almost like they're cursed. Ask Jason Taylor and Zach Thomas which team is the worst. And they'll say, Miami Dolphins, Miami Dolphins, Miami Dolphins number. Oh, what the hell, 32. Miami Dolphins, Miami Dolphins, Miami Dolphins, now they're through. They stunk. Trump 21, and they still do. Wait till you hear this. A representative Mark Foley action figure went once, twice, and was finally sold for $315.01 on eBay yesterday after 27 bids were in it. Three hundred fifteen dollars and one cent. An action figure. I need some action. Yeah. Sculptor David Johnson created the Foley figurine as part of his Whores in the News series, following the congressman's scandal involving those young pages in Washington D.C. He's a real page turner. Mm-hmm. The inaugural figurine was Paris Hilton, followed by Pamela Rogers, the Tennessee teacher who had sexual relations with a thirteen-year-old student. I'm always looking for bad behavior on the news to ridicule and Clay Johnson, based in Lafayette, Colorado, told us the figurine's proud owner is Jamie Jonker of Washington D.C. Who built? Who uh, bid three hundred and fifteen oh one on eBay? An action figure, of Mark Foley, and actually, it's got. Uh, it shows a picture of the figurine, and he's got his arm out, like uh, kind of like uh, curled around, like like maybe a page would be in that arm. Maybe there's somebody something missing in that figurine. Okay. You know what I mean? No. Or or not? Who the hell knows? Katrina Van der. Oh God <laughs> Almighty! <laughs> this is that fantastic. What I just found. What'd you find? Uh, you, you'll have to wait and hear it. All right. I love surprise. Because the headline on Katrina's column here is, he's still the one. Oh, no. Oh, you don't like this? I like the fun. What's the matter with you? Probably anti Is this the one by Orleans? Yeah. Okay. Well, who else would it be by? Shania Twain. Look, with all due respect to Shania Twain, who I like just fine, a lot. (laughs) 
Anyway, Katrina Van Den Fuvel says he's still the one. Music fans know John Hall as the lead guitarist for Orleans and songwriter of hit singles like Still the One, Dancing in the Moonlight, and Dance with Me. Activists know him as the musician who organized no new concerts and released the song Power, an ode to alternative energy, just three weeks before the Three Mile Island meltdown. His fellow citizens in upstate New York know him as a member of the Ulster County Legislature and president of the Saugerties Board of Education. And now it looks like Americans might just soon know this great musician and congressman and, and good man as Congressman John Hall, Democrat of New York. Oh! Well, you started it. Hall is poised to one seat an incumbent previously thought to be invincible, Representative Sue Kelly of the 19th District. According to Congressional Quarterly, Kelly took 60% of the vote two years ago and has exceeded 60% every election since 98. That's why risk-averse inside the Beltway Democrats initially lined up behind Judy Adelot, a lawyer and one-time Republican who they felt would appeal to the electorate as a moderate. But longtime activist Hall believed he could take his message directly to the people, and he did, to the people. He hired Amy Little, a 30-year veteran organizer on social justice issues, as his campaign director. Little's career past includes raising over $30 million for citizen action groups and labor coalitions across the country and serving as a national field director for Go TV and voter registration in 2004. Since taking the helm of the Hall campaign, she's built a gutsy and effective grassroots organization. Hall has a simple yet powerful message that resonates with voters. He told the Osteroy Report, The biggest issue these days are ending the war in Iraq, achieving universal health care with an affordable prescription drug plan, and finding safe, clean, renewable solutions to our energy needs. On why he's running, Hall says, The situation in the nation and the world is at such a crucial juncture, and the stakes are so high, right now there are no checks and balances. I want to be a voice for creativity and honesty in solving our problems. I want to be proud not just of our country, but of our government, he be saying. The emphasis on grassroots field operations produced terrific results. On primary day, the campaign had 400 people in the field, and voting numbers were up 100% from the previous election. Hall defeated a lot by nearly a 2-to-1 margin and got 49% of the vote in a four-way race. The field team has now grown to 1,200 people, and it seems Hall, who flew under the radar for so long, may turn out to be the perfect stealth candidate to unseat Kelly. How do you like that? Sadly, instead of celebrating Hall's ability to connect with the voters, not to mention his down to earth manner, big ticket Democrats are still shying away from Hall's progressive credentials. One sign of that, 85% of Hall's fundraising comes from individuals contributing $200 or less. I don't want to step on them. Good. Meanwhile, Kelly's done nothing to endear herself to voters. Questions have arisen over her role in the Foley scandal, which broke on her 70th birthday since she was the chair of the page board from 99 to 2001. She lost her cool at an editorial board meeting when it was brought up. She literally ran away from reporters who wanted to talk to her, and she's defended in support of the Bush administration ad nauseum while building a voting record voters will love if they love Tom DeLay. On Sunday, the New York Times endorsed Hall as a lawmaker of energy, steady conviction, and clear principles with an ambitious and coherent platform. He's also collected the endorsement of the Times-Herald record, which has endorsed Kelly in the past. This week, he'll announce the Sierra Club is backing and is heavily supported by labor. While Kelly still has the typical big bucks of a Republican incumbent and no one should underestimate the work that remains, the human power supplied by a unique coalition of labor and environmental activists could prove to be the difference on Election Day. If so, a lot of happy progressives will be dancing in the moonlight come November 7th. <clears throat> See, you must have been psychic when you played that. Mm -hmm. When that great song. 1,309 votes on the poll. Man, I bet you Stu Goss is impaling himself. The biggest names of the best right talent. Now. This is Neil Rogers. Sports Radio 560 QAM. Well, Alfred, I have a collect call from Larry King. Will you accept the charges? No. Wait till you hear what they say. It's all next on Larry King Live. Clay Aiken is our special guest. <laughs> Do you think generally the gay life is more accepted? I have no idea. What's up? Wait a minute. What's the big deal? What I do in my private life is nobody's business anymore. Nothing against being gay. Well, are you? I don't really have too much control over that. I'm kind of a... Uh... It's your choice. Um... As a hypothetical. Oh, hypothetically. I'm sorry. Um... I am. Aha. Girls just want to have fun. <laughs> Turn the other cheek and all that type of thing. But uh, <laughs> touching. You get it in the mall in North Carolina, too? I get it every <laughs> Now. And I'm pretty good at hiding it, I think. Let's take a call. Independence, Missouri. Hello. Clay, I've been a fan for a long time. Could I see your package? Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> the big one. It is. We'll be right back. <laughs> Oh my God. 
know, I've told you this a million times before, and it's very boring, but I'll say it again. Alan O'Day is okay. No, he's an old, uh, well, he's he's, gay? I know, well, he wasn't old then. Well, he's just a fat guy with a beard. Okay. You know? Is that why you don't like him? Exactly. Okay. Oh, boy. <laughs> Are you picking on poor Mary's Hopkin again? I would never. I would be surprised to see you hopping on Mary Hopkin one of these days. Maybe once upon a time. Yeah. Okay, you want to pick on Mary? I'll get even with you now. Oh, I give up. I give up. Yeah. Producing an eighteenth of an ounce of sound. <laughs> oh, he put the hole in David's soul. You know, I have a lot of Barry Manilow in here if you want to play that game. No, thanks. I got a lot of Barry Manilow bits. 1,322 votes on the poll today. Pretty uh, out, uh, outstanding and outwhelming. Of course, it's about Halloween. Who don't like Halloween? Except people that don't like candy. Right. I voted for fun. It's a time for fun. Now, do we, uh, we talk about mallow cups. Remember that yeah. show we did about yeah, the candy did. bars? Oh. The audience hated that. I thought that was a lot of fun. Yeah, screw them. And I did a lot of work on that, too. I did all that research, and I printed sure, out 80 million website. sheets of paper about every candy bar. In fact, that place, I gave the information out, talking mm-hmm. about giving free commercials. And was it Brian? Chicken neck, or somebody ordered a bunch of candy from there. It was stale and crap or whatever. Remember that? Yeah, I forget who. One of our, one of our people. Somebody actually we might like, which we don't like much of anybody. But uh, Mallow Cups. Uh-huh. They're around. Isn't that? They are? Sure. Ain't never seen them here, eh? Well, what can well I those are really good. They're like mm-hmm. two and two to a package, if I can say, right. can I say package. Oh. And you bite into the center of it, and it's got like a well. Daniel Ellsberg writes about the next war, public in the dark about government's plans for war in Iran. Oh, this is a long article. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'll just, I'll just highlight it for you, okay? It's too long. He says, a hidden crisis is underway. Many government insiders are aware of serious plans for war with Iran, but Congress and the public remain largely in the dark. The current situation is very like that of 64, the year preceding our overt open-ended escalation of the Vietnam War, and 2002, the year leading up to the U.S. invasion of Iraq. In both cases, if one or more conscientious insiders had closed the information gap with unauthorized disclosures to the public, a disastrous war might have been averted entirely. My own failure to act in time to that effect in 64 was pointed out to me by Wayne Morris 35 years ago, writes Ellsberg. Morris was one of only two U.S. senators to vote against the Tonkin Gulf Resolution August 7, 64. He had believed correctly that President Johnson would treat the resolution as a congressional declaration of war. His colleagues, however, accepted White House assurances that the president sought no wider war and had no intention of expanding hostilities without further consulting them. Believe they, they believed they were simply expressing bipartisan support for U.S. air attacks on North Vietnam three days earlier, which the president and Secretary of Defense McNamara had told them were in retaliation for the unequivocal, unprovoked attack by North Vietnamese torpedo boats on U.S. destroyers on routine patrol in international waters. Even, uh, each of the assurances above have been a false, a conscious lie. That they were lies that had only been revealed to the public seven years later with the publication of the Pentagon Papers, several thousand pages of top-secret documents on U.S. decision-making in Vietnam that I had released to the press. The very first installment published by the Times on June 13, 71, had proven the official account of the Tonkin Gulf episode to be a deliberate deception. When we met in September, Morse had just heard me mention to an audience that all the evidence of fraud had been in my own Pentagon safe at the time of the Tonkin Gulf vote. By coincidence, I had started work as a special assistant to an assistant secretary of defense the day of the alleged attack, which had not, in fact, occurred at all. After my talk, Morris, who had been senior member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in 64, said to me, if you had given those documents to me at the time, the talking golf resolution would never have gotten out of committee, and if it somehow had been brought up on the floor of the Senate for a vote, it never would have passed. He was telling me, it seemed, that it had been in my power seven years earlier to avert the deaths so far of 50,000 Americans and millions of Vietnamese with many more to come. It was not something I was eager to hear. After all, I had just been indicted on what eventually were 12 federal felony accounts with a possible sentence of 115 years in prison for releasing the Pentagon Papers to the public. I had consciously accepted that prospect in some small hope of shortening the war. Morse was saying that I had missed a real opportunity to prevent the war altogether. My first reaction was that Morse had overestimated the significance of the Tonkin Gulf Resolution and therefore the alleged consequences of my not blocking it in August. After all, I felt that Johnson would have found another occasion to get such a resolution passed or gone ahead without one, even if someone had exposed the fraud in early August. Years later, though, it hit me. <coughs> the thought hit me. 
What if I had told Congress and the public later in the fall of 64 the whole truth about what was coming with all the documents I'd acquired my job by September, October, or November? Not just as Morse had suggested the contents of a few files on the events surrounding the Tonkin incident, all that I had in early August, but the drawerfuls of critical working papers, memos, estimates, and detailed escalation options revealing the evolving plans of the Johnson administration for a wider war expected to commence soon after, right after the election. In short, what if I had put out before the end of the year, whether before or after the November election, all the classified papers from that period, as I eventually did disclose in 1971? Had I done so, the public in Congress would have learned that Johnson's campaign theme, We Seek No Wider War, was a hoax. They would have learned, in fact, that the Johnson administration had been heading in secret toward essentially the same policy of expanded war that his presidential rival, Senator Barry Goldwater, openly advocated, a policy that the voters overwhelmingly repudiated at the polls. The run-up to the 1964 uh, Gulf of Tonkin Resolution was almost exactly parallel to the run-up of the 2002 Iraq War Resolution. In both cases, the President and his top cabinet officers consciously deceived Congress and the public about a supposed short-run threat in order to justify wind support for carrying out pre-existing offensive plans against a country that was not a near-term danger to the U.S. In both cases, the deception was essential to the political feasibility of the program precisely because expert opinion inside the government foresaw costs, dangers, and low prospects of success that would have doomed the project politically if there had been truly informed public discussion beforehand. And in both cases, that necessary deception could not have succeeded without the obedient silent, silence of hundreds of insiders who knew full well both the deception and the folly of acting upon it. I think I am going to finish this. I'm just going to pause Good. right there. Good what? Good, Good I'm glad you're going to finish it. I need closure. You need closure? Yeah. Close your yeah. I'll play Mary Hopkins again. Oh, gee. If you don't That's cut the right. cram. There's worse. What's wrong with Mary Hopkins? Nothing. Nothing at all. She never stole a freight train. One hit Not wonder. That was on Apple Records, I believe. Can you remember now? Can you actually see the label on the record? No. no. 1241 is QM Sports Time. Let me tell you right now, speaking of sports cars, there's nothing like a Corvette. Take it from me. I've had about 6,000 of them over the last 20 years, and I've bought virtually every one of them at Lou Back Road Chevrolet. And that's where you ought to be shopping right now. They've got a fantastic selection of Corvettes and trucks and SUVs and minivans and great used cars, too. Every one of them backed by Carfax Guarantee. And don't forget, during this month of October, which has just a few days left to go, Lou Backroot's running their race to 1,000 for the first time in its history. They want to sell 1,000 cars in one month. And as a result, they're staying open for you every night till midnight to get to that 1,000 number. How many votes we got on the poll? 1332. See, we got them beat. Forget the price. Make them an offer. They'll beat any deal. More money for your trade. Zero percent financing. We rates up to six grand. Whatever it takes, they'll do it for you. Only at Lou Back Road Chevrolet with two great locations for you. You'll find them in Pompano Beach, a quarter mile west of I-95, and at Coconut Creek on 441, just south of the Sawgrass Expressway. Don't forget, Lou Back Road Chevy is staying open until midnight every night. So get your ass over to Lou Back Road for unbeatable service, selection, and, of course, salespeople who really know their stuff. The best deal on the Chevy you'll ever get in your life. Or check them on the Wicked Web at LouBackRoad.com. B-A-C-H-R-O-D-T. LouBackRoad.com. The biggest names, the best talent. This is Neil Rogers. Sports Radio 560. Q-A-M. Now, is that the one? That's the one. That's the one. Can never be sure. Barbara Streisand is trashing George W. Bush in her new concert tour. And now, the president is fighting back. Babs, you don't know anything. <laughs> Why? Don't you just shut up and sing. <laughs> the Commander-in-Chief counterpunches in a once-in-a-lifetime stage extravaganza. Barbara Streisand has got a gigantic behind. Absolutely. <laughs> Don't know how James Brolin taps that. From the way she let herself go. Tickets are going fast to see George W. Bush on stage dissing the Democratic diva Barbara Streisand. Thank you very much. You're beautiful. Good night. CKLW yesterday. Whatever happened to Ardeen Taylor, anyhow? I don't know. Not another one hit wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, 
I can't believe what else is on is this one for your buddy, your closest best personal friend. You know who he is? No. Oh. The guy with the flies, the eyes. Compared to some people, he's my best friend. There you go. He'd be your buddy. He's squeezing that David Cassidy a blow-up doll. Well, never mind. Anyway, getting back to our story here, getting back to this Daniel Ellsberg column. Please. The next war. He says, one insider aware of the Iraq plans and knowledgeable about the inevitably disastrous result of executing these plans was Richard Clark, chief of counterterrorism for George W. Bush and advisor to three presidents before him. He had spent 9-11-2001 in the White House coordinating the nation's response to the attacks. He reports in his memoir, Against All Enemies, discovering the next morning to his amazement that most discussions there were about attacking Iraq. Clark told Bush and Rumsfeld that Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11 or with its perpetrator, Al-Qaeda. As Clark said to Secretary of State Colin Powell that afternoon, having been attacked by Al-Qaeda, for us now to go bombing Iraq in response, which Rumsfeld was already urging, would be like our invading Mexico after the Japanese attacked us at Pearl Harbor. That's right, Hopper, with the Japanese, not the Germans. Actually, Clark foresaw that it would be much worse than that. Attacking Iraq would not only be a crippling distraction from the task of pursuing the real enemy, but it would, in fact, aid that enemy. Nothing America could have done would have provided al-Qaeda and its new generation of cloned groups a better recruitment device than our unprovoked invasion of an oil-rich Arab country. I single out Clark, by all accounts among the best of the public servants, only because of his unique role in counterterrorism and because, thanks to his illuminating 2004 memoir, we know his thoughts at the time, and in particular the intensity of his anguish and frustration. Such a memoir allows us, as we read each new revelation, to ask a simple question. What difference might it have made to events if he had told us this at the time? Clark was not, of course, the only one who could have told us or told Congress. We knew from other accounts that both of his key judgments, the absence of linkage between al-Qaeda and Sodom, and his correct prediction that the attacking Iraq would actually make America less secure and strengthen the broader racial, radical Islamic terrorist movement, were shared by many professionals in the CIA, the State Department, and the military. Yet neither of these crucial expert conclusions was made available to the Congress or the public by Clark or anybody else, in the 18-month run-up to the war. Even as they heard the president lead the country to the opposite false impressions toward what these officials saw as a disastrous, unjustified war, they felt obliged to keep their silence. Costly as their silence was to the country and their victims, I feel I know their mindset. I had long prized my own identity as a keeper of the president's secrets. In 1964, it never even occurred to me to break the many secrecy agreements I had signed in the Marines at the Rand Corporation and the Pentagon. Although I already knew the Vietnam War was a mistake and based on lies, my loyalties then were to the Secretary of Defense and the President. I'm not proud that it took me years of war to awaken to the higher loyalties owed by every government official to the rule of law, to our soldiers in harm's way, to our fellow citizens, and explicitly the Constitution, which every one of us had sworn an oath to support and uphold. It took me that long to recognize that the secrecy agreements we had signed frequently conflicted with our oath to uphold the Constitution. That conflict arose almost daily, unnoticed by me or other officials, whenever we were secretly aware that the President and other executive officers were lying or misleading Congress. In giving priority and effect to my promise of secrecy, ignoring my constitutional obligation, I was no worse or better than any of my Vietnam-era colleagues or those who later saw the Iraq War approaching and failed to warn anyone outside the executive branch. Ironically, Clark told Vanity Four in 2004 that in his own youth he had ardently protested the complete folly of the Vietnamese War and that he wanted to get involved in national security in 73 as a career so that Vietnam didn't happen again. He is left today with a sense of failure. It's an arrogant thing to think that I have ever stopped another Vietnam, but it's really filled me with frustration that when I saw Iraq coming I wasn't able to do anything. After having spent 30 years in national security and having been some senior level of positions, you'd think I might be able to have some influence, some tiny influence, but I couldn't have any, Clark said. But it wasn't too arrogant. I believe for Clark to aspire to stop this second Vietnam personally, he actually had a good chance to do so throughout 2002, the same chance Senator Morse had pointed out to me. Instead of writing a memoir to be cleared for publication in 2004, a year after Iraq had been invaded, Clark could have made his knowledge of the war to come and its danger to our security public before the war. He could have supported his testimony with hundreds of files of documents from his office safe and computer to which he then still had access. He could have given these to both the media and the then Democratic-controlled Senate. If I had criticized the president of the press as special assistant in the summer of 2002, Clark told Larry King, in March 2004, I would have been fired within an hour. That is undoubtedly true, but that should be the last. But should that be the last word on that course? To be sure, virtually all bureaucrats would agree with him, as he told King, that his only responsible options at that point were either to resign quietly or to spin from the White House to the press, as he did. But that's just the working norm, I mean, to question here. His perceived alternative, I wish to suggest, was precisely the court being fired for telling the truth to the public with documentary evidence in the summer of 2002. For doing that, Clark would not only have lost his job, his clearance, and his career as an executive official, he would almost surely have been prosecuted and might have gone to prison. 
But the controversy that ensued would not have been about hindsight and blame. It would have been about whether a war in Iraq would make the U.S. safer and whether it was otherwise justified. That debate did not occur in 2002, just as a real debate about war in Vietnam didn't occur in 2064, thanks to the disciplined reticence of Clark and many others. Whatever his personal fate, which might have been severe, his disclosures would have come before the war, perhaps instead of it. We face today a crisis similar to those of 64 and 2002, a crisis hidden once again from the public and most of Congress. Articles by Seymour Hersh and others have revealed that, as in both those earlier cases, the President has secretly directed the completion, though not yet execution, of military operational plans, not merely hypothetical contingency plans, but constantly updated plans, with movement of forces in high states of readiness for a prompt implementation on command for attacking a country that, unless attacked itself, poses no threat to the U.S., in this case, Iran. According to these reports, many high-level officers and government officials are convinced that our President will attempt to bring about regime change in Iran by air attack that he and his vice president have long been no less committed secretly to doing so than they were about attacking Iraq, and that his secretary of defense is as madly optimistic about the prospects for fast, cheap military success there as he was in Iraq. Even more ominously, Philip Giraldi, a former CIA official, reported in the American Conservative a year ago that Vice President Cheney's office has directed contingency planning for a large-scale air assault on Iran employing both conventional and tactical nuclear weapons, and that several senior Air Force officers involved in the planning were appalled at the implications of what they were doing, that Iran is being set up for an unprovoked nuclear attack, but that no one is prepared to damage his career by posing any objection. Several of Hirsch's sources have confirmed both the detailed operational planning for use of nuclear weapons against deep underground Iranian installations and military resistance to this prospect, which led several senior officials to consider resigning. Hirsch notes that opposition by the Joint Chiefs in April to the White House led to the White House withdrawal of the nuclear option, for now, I would say. The operational plans remain in existence to be drawn upon for a decisive blow if the President deems necessary. Many of these sources regard the planned massive air attack, with or without nuclear weapons, as almost sure to be catastrophic for the Middle East, the position of the U.S. in the world, our troops in Iraq, the world economy, and U.S. domestic security. Thus, they're as deeply concerned about these process, prospects as many other insiders were in the year before the Iraq invasion. That's why, unlike the lead-up to Vietnam or Iraq, some insiders are leaking to reporters. But since these disclosures, so far without documents and without attribution, have not evidently had enough credibility to raise public alarm, the question is whether such officials have yet reached the limit of their responsibilities to our country. Assuming Hirsch's so far anonymous sources mean what they say, that this is, as one puts it, a juggernaut that has to be stopped, I believe it's time for one or more of them to go beyond fragmentary leaks un unaccompanied by documents. That means doing what no other active official or consultant has ever done in a timely way, when neither Richard Clark nor I nor anyone else thought of doing until we were no longer officials, no longer had access to current documents after bombs had fallen and thousands had died years into a war. It means going outside executive channels as officials with contemporary access to expose the president's lies and oppose his war policy publicly before the war with unequivocal evidence from inside. Simply resigning in silence doesn't meet moral or political responsibilities of officials rightly appalled by the thrust of secret policy. I hope that one or more such persons will make the sober decision of accepting sacrifice of clearance and career and risk of prison to disclose comprehensive files that convey irrefutably official secret estimates of cost and prospects and dangers of the military plans being considered. What needs disclosure is the full internal controversy, the secret critiques, as well as the Pentagon Papers of the Middle East. But unlike in 1971, the ongoing secret debate should be made available before our war in the region expands to include Iran, before the 61-year moratorium on nuclear war has ended violently, to give our democracy a chance to foreclose either of these catastrophes. The personal risks of doing this are very great, yet they're not as great as the risks of bodies and lives rasking daily of over 130,000 young Americans with many yet to join them in an unjust war. Our country has urgent need for comparable courage, moral and civil courage from its public servants. They owe us the truth before the next war begins. That's oh, the Daniel Rosberg. Right. I'm sure glad I finished that. It's a good, I'm glad, glad I had that idea. 1,357 votes in that poll today. A poll about Halloween. And QAM Sports Time, by the way, is 12.56. The biggest names, the best talent. This is Neil Rogers. Sports Radio 560 AM. Just the one to two hour. It's a phenomenon. Oh, right. Once as I was sitting in a tavern. Having a few draft beers with some friends. <laughs> when in walked a group of most peculiar people. I wasn't really sure if they were men. No, I have never ever seen a faggot. You fairy! From where I come, they are so very rare. But what I saw, it made me want to throw up. 
But I knew that it was impolite to stare Those are the gays, my friend They almost act like men They laugh the thing together at the bar <laughs> They hold each other's nuts While their friends grab their butts Those are the gays, oh yes, those are the gays Now I know it's really not my business No, I'm not really one to hold a grudge, but I can't believe they smoke each other's sausage and then get down on all fours and pack the fudge. Those are the gays, my friend. They almost act like them. They laugh and sing together at the bar. They hold each other's nuts while their friends grab their butts. Those are the gays. Oh, yes, those are the Guess who, guess who you mentioned before? I can't believe I found this. Good Canadian girl, a guy, whatever she is, whatever. Oh, Man Murray. Man Murray. She's got a whole bunch of kids, you know. Got to say, man. Right. Beneath this snow in the blue cold and green, the unborn grass lies waiting for his coat to turn to green. And if that isn't good enough. Oh, boy. It's Freddy Boom Boom Cannon, man. Was he ever ugly or what? Yes, he was. Uh, 104, that, that's one of the only... It's interesting when you see those infomercials, which you don't watch. Josh watches them mm-hmm. religiously, all the infomercials for the like the Time Life series, you know? Yeah, well, yeah it's my favorite. No, it's not. And, and let me just tell you the bad news about that GT Express. Remember I told you I was making my omelets in there, and then I was a little concerned about the fact that I thought it was the egg beaters that caused the stuff to stick there. Uh-huh. It's supposed to be nonstick. Uh, yeah, and... And I went out and I cleaned that baby up and smeared a little olive oil on there. I got some more real eggs again. And I made an omelet the other day with, like, some real eggs on Tuesday. And it's still stuck like all of it made a mess. Yeah. So maybe the nonstick coating wore off. Right. Maybe it don't last very long. Maybe if you want to eat it. I beg your pardon? Oh, great. Mmm. Maybe that's why I had, like, 85 visits to the throne this morning. could be nonstick. No, that's for sure. Sliders. 1,370 votes. We got 1,400 licked today. And we probably could have made 15 again for the second day in a row, but we don't want to set the bar too high. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. then if you set the bar too high, like little people like George and Vern Troyer can't get a drink. Yeah, I got the check. Got my car fixed. It's for my birthday. Fixed by my own first. You care, right? Geico. Real service. Real savings. It's for my birthday. 1,370 votes on the poll about Halloween. Well, put a, put a pumpkin out in the front and light a candle, okay? Clear Channel Communications, speaking of clowns, the largest U.S. radio broadcaster, is considering a possible sale of the company. Oh, my God. And hired Goldman Sachs and Company as an advisor. The shares jumped yesterday 9.7%. The board is evaluating alternatives to increase the share price and can assure that a transaction will occur, San Antonio-based Clear Channel said in a statement. The hiring of Goldman Sachs brings the Mays family, which controls Cheap Channel, closer to a possible leveraged buyout. Oh, let's have the Beasleys buy them. <laughs> yeah, right. Chief Executive Officer Mark Mays has spun off the company's live entertainment unit, Live Nation, Inc., and sold shares of its outdoor advertising unit, Clear Channel Outdoor Holdings, Inc., in an IPO. In their case, it ought to be an IPU. The stock has been hurt by slow growth in the radio industry. 
Clear Channel spokeswoman Lisa Dollinger declined to comment beyond the release. The company said in a statement that it won't comment any more about the matter unless a specific transaction is approved by the board. Shares of Clear Channel gained three dollars and fifteen cent yesterday to thirty five thirty extended trading. The shares rose yesterday following the CNBC report that the Mays family is warming to the idea of a leveraged buyout. They're warming to it. The company has had serious talks with Kohlberg, Kravis, Roberts, and company about going private. Financial Times reported yesterday, citing people familiar with the situation. The Mays family previously rejected approaches from private equity investors, Financial Times said. It sure would be nice if some religious sub bunch of nuts would buy this station and pay us all off. What Especially George with his us. big contract. And Josh, oh my God, did you see the deal they made him? Yeah, what a deal. Or not. They're, 1,375 votes. I got news for it, man. If they, if this station got sold and they had it paid me off in the next to two and a quarter years, whatever it is, I'd send you guys both, uh, I don't know. Your best wishes? I'd send you my best wishes and... Eight bucks. That's right. Woo! Not each, but like to divide between you. 1,375. The votes are pouring in on Halloween. Hang a dead cat from your door on Halloween. It's always good, always good to keep the evil spirits out, isn't it? Sure. And the witches, too. Any witches come to your house, burn them. Burn their ass. They might be friends of mine. Well, like I said, Ken Becker is a bright, educated, and progressive guy who normally scoffs at conspiracy theories, but the talent Oregon resident isn't scoffing at those who believe the truth has yet. Wouldn't that be something if you lived in a town called Talent? Where are you from? Funnier funnier places than that. It's kind of a strange name. The talent Oregon resident isn't scoffing at those who believe the truth has yet to be told about the 9-11 attack on the World Trade Center in New York and the Pentagon in Washington. Becker, 52, is founder of 9-11 Truth Now, an independent grassroots group. Oh, the grassroots, boy, I got them somewhere. Demanding an independent criminal investigation in 9-11. I'm open-minded, but I'm also skeptical. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, said the married father of two. I have a family. I have my own business. I'm an Eagle Scout. Let's live for today with the grassroots. Right? Oh, yeah. I can name that song in one note. And talk it up without even being able to hear it. That's enough. Oh, how about this one? Midnight, uh... Very good. Yeah. Confessions. What's this one? Uh, I'd, uh, I'd tell a thousand, I'd live a... Close. Maybe a you're all uh, what is it? Yeah, you, you got it. What is it called? I'd wait. I'd wait a million years. Right? Right. Oh, yeah. What is that? Temptation Eye. Okay, that's enough of this crap, okay? What are we, a music well, station? Much more Soon fun to be, these, baby. Uh, if they can be stories. sports radio, we can have QA and music time. How do you like that? Take your uh, sports time and shove it. And if you're wondering what I'm talking about this morning at 9.58 exactly, I'll never forget it as long as I love Kenny Walker in closing out our morning Kenny and Bo morning sports show said QAM sports time is 9.58. And I sat here, I nearly dropped another load on the chair. Maybe that's why I had to go again. How could you have gone these nine plus years and not noticed that before? I never, because uh, coming from him, see, that if Mad Dog uh, said it or Hank said I it or Eddie K or, or Curtis, one of the sports uh, but when he said it, it, it like sealed the deal. Told you they got to him. Oh, they did. They absolutely They must talk about Ding Dong School. Yeah. They must have threatened to cut off his Ding Dong. They done Ding Donged him. Ding Dong, the swish is dead. Poor Kenny Walker, yeah. man. He's a sport. He's, I mean, I know he does the PA at the Dolphin Games. Am I right about that, Josh? Yes, you are. But he never, I'm sure that when he was on with Footy on Y100, nobody ever thought, oh, well, he's just another sports nerd, Kenny Walker, right? He's a broadcaster. He's a, was a morning guy. Anyway, I don't want to get into that. It's your fault. Mm-hmm. Becker, 52, is founder of 9 Truth Now, an independent... Grassroots group demanding an independent criminal investigation in 9-11. He says, 9-11 raised so many questions that have never been answered by our government. I don't know what happened, but we do need to find out. The group is sponsoring the Oregon premiere of 9-11, The Myth and the Reality, a documentary film that will be shown this Saturday evening in the Performing Arts Center at Crater High School in Central Point, Oregon. Let's, let's all go out to Oregon. I've never been there. Never been in the great northwest, Washington or Oregon. You've been there, right? Beautiful, beautiful area. Nice people. Beautiful people. And not far from Vancouver, eh? Right. Maybe that's Victoria, why. Victoria, B.C., where you can light up a big fat one. You can roll the uh, newspaper up. Lush, clean, relatively lush. speaking. Yeah. Well, Josh would like the lush part. You know, featuring, featuring David Ray Griffin, author and professor emeritus of philosophy, religion, and theology at Claremont School of Theology in California. It raises nine points, this movie does, which question the government's explanation of the incident. Following the screening, Ken Jenkins, the film's producer and director, will respond to questions from the audience. And it goes on about when, and what the, you know, tickets are 10 bucks. You'll have to spend like uh, 600 to go out there. During the film, Griffin explains in detail why he doubts the Bush administration's explanations that it was surprised by the attack and why the hijacked airliners were not intercepted. 
He also questions how the steel frame buildings could have imploded the way they did and the proof the attacks were carried out by al-Qaeda under the direction of Osama bin Laden. He also doubts the story of the attack on the Pentagon, and the Bush administration claims that the pilot was an amateur and an al-Qaeda hijacker. Moreover, he doesn't agree with those who believe the nation's political and military leaders would have no motive for orchestrating the attacks. Film director Ken Jenkins, 59, of San Rafael, California, has made several 9-11 films, all of which question the official story of the attack. This was not a casual issue to take on, he said in a telephone interview. At first, we were called nuts, crazy. People said we were uh, hated our country. Yeah, why do you hate America, Tommy? It felt early on that we were putting our lives on the line for even talking about it. He added, these questions are now accepted by an increasing number of people. We're a long ways from total accepted, but people are having their doubts now about the official explanation. Becker said the local group has got about a dozen people in its core with roughly 150 on its email list. He said those who question the official 9-11 explanation can no longer be written off as so many conspiracy kooks. Only 16% of Americans think the Bush administration is telling the truth about 9-11, Becker said, citing a recent New York Times CBS poll. That's huge. That means that 84% think something else. There's also a growing disenchantment with mainstream media's ex- exploration of the issues, he said. I've always thought we lived in a democracy and that news is news, he said, noting it no longer feels that way. There's a whole lot of information our press doesn't cover, he added, so we're becoming our own media. For-profit journalism has come at the expense of truth. Becker, who's got a bachelor's degree in design and industry and operates his own import business, wonders why there was such a delay in scrambling fighter jets to intercept the airliners, a point that Griffin and others make as well. Who was responsible for that? And where the hell was Spider-Man, by the way? Busy, After seeing those two movies, we sure could have used him on 9-11, couldn't we? Damn it. Spider-Man, spider <laughs> Who gave the order to stand down? Something must have taken place for an event of this magnitude to be ignored. He says he wonders why no heads rolled if the military did react unusually slowly to a threat on the Pentagon, which he notes would be one of the most heavily guarded facilities in the world. Human beings make mistakes, he said. I'm a father, a businessman. I'm alive. I make mistakes. Yet nothing happened to those who make mistakes if it happened the way the administration explained. This is a big red flag to me, he said. Becker, whose birthday is September 11th, also agrees with Griffin there is no proven connection between Al-Qaeda and 9-11. The facts don't support the evidence, he said in the administration explanation. For additional information, see 911truthnow.org. You know right now? I already looked no. at it. I took a peek at it. There's your buddy Rumsfeld. He's governed their country. Here, here, here right here right. Rumsfeld. I'd rather hear a what's-her-name. What's her name? Wouldn't you? Judy oh, Collins? They probably got him on there now, too. And Marie? And we've already passed over some divisions to the Iraqi military chain of command. But it's not just security. It is, it is as I've said, the reconciliation process is going to have three or four major milestones. You might mention my name to Rice Marshal Gurry. Yeah. Hey, Amen. QM Sports Time. QM Music Time is 114. The biggest names, the best talent. This is Neil Rogers. Sports Radio 560. Oh, solid A. My God, your breasts are beautiful. Go! Go! 
Tell me he died, Gene Pitney, because I love Gene Pitney. I think he, he did. I think he died. Get out of here. I don't know. Can we talk about that on the show that he may have done? You better Wikipedia and Google his ass right now. We're going to Google your ass, Gene. Wasn't that on that pool that uh, Sean sent in yesterday? Sean said he likes to shop at the Gap. He likes to go in the window and gate. In the Gap? Gap. Pretty woman. By the way, you know, up until yeah, he's this... Dead. Uh, I beg your pardon? I said, yeah, he's dead. I uh, vaguely remember, even with my Alzheimer's kicking in, I vaguely remember Gene Pitney dying here. Now, it wasn't that long ago. Wasn't it this year? What's the date? Well, if you just Google it, how can you not John know the date? is the one that uh, found it. I'll have to click on the story. No Give guy? Uh, I'll get I'm it. looking. Jesus Christ. Of course, no our connection here is so yeah, slow. Yeah, it takes all day. I know he died in a hotel. That's all I know right now. He died in a hotel? 06, 4506. Through his tour in the UK. I told you it was not that long ago. That's why it's, uh, you know, like, did that really happen? I sure as hell hope not. Because only love can break a, a heart. Only, only Joyce can break a can cut a. But anyway, up until uh, maybe just five minutes ago, my whole life I never realized. I, I guess I saw it once before, but I always thought the name of that song was Pretty Woman. Didn't you? It's similar. It's oh, Pretty Woman. That's right. Did you know that? I, I did. Now that you reminded me, it's oh. Pretty Woman. I don't know why, because he doesn't say, oh, pretty woman, and when he uh, starts the song. I guess eventually he gets around and says, oh, and once in a while, like, oh. like that. Although it really is. Rock solid. See? What the hell is that? Pretty woman. By Van Halen. Oh, by Van Halen. Oh, my God. Now, is that one called Pretty Woman? Yeah. Oh, that's or, called Oh, Pretty Woman. Oh! 1,403 votes. Let's have another O. Come on. Oh! Thank you. Halloween is fun. Yeah, it's fun if you sure. want to have fun. It if can be writing right. if you're just a hard Go ass. Go to a party, you know? get drunk, eat some candy. That's right. That's exactly right. Eat a bunch of free crap. Maybe get like a, you know, a, a pin stuck in your throat. Halloween is fun, 597. Only for little kids, 387. Annoying, 143. How about another excuse to uh, get drunk? I'm, I'm not saying put that on there, but it, well, it's not. Well, that, I'm, well, I was thinking of you. It's all part of fun. Waking up in the morning, that's another excuse to get drunk for Josh, at least sometime during the day. Hopefully not before 1. Annoying, 143. Well, it's annoying if you're one of those people that hates those little kids coming around. Pick a tree, knocking on your door, you know. Just shut down all the lights, go into the back room. That's and right. Turn the TV nothing. sound way, right. way down. That's right. Don't put out no jack-o'-lantern. Keep the lights shut off. Go in the bedroom and lock the door, hopefully with somebody else. Stupid 98. A waste of time 63. I hate this poll 46. Only 3.2% hate this poll. And, of course, it's timely. And what about circus? What about our annual circus poll? You never did find out when circus. See, the reason you wouldn't know, I'll tell you. Witchcraft 41, dangerous 29. Witchcraft. I'm surprised they didn't get much higher. Let's see. S-U-C-C-O-T. See, it's always with a T-H on the end. Right. Circus. Yeah, Sukkoth. Wikipedia, let's see, the Jewish festival of Sukkot, Sukkot, Sukkot. But when is it? Oh, man, that's bad. When, when the hell is it? I don't know. I'm going to the interactive Jewish calendar. Oh, that's bad. The Egyptian place Sukkoth, near the start of the Israeli Israelites' exodus from Egypt. It's enough to mind I want to make you play the Israelites by Desmond Decker. Remember that? No. You don't remember the Israelites? We played it for quite a lot. We've got a, a, a chicken neck song on that. What is wrong with you? I don't have the original, though. I'm telling you, Moses was the wisest man. Ha, what are you, my sugar? Now? Anyway, have you found Sukkot yet or not? S-U-C-C-O-T-H. Sukkoth. Uh, the, the Erev uh, Sukkot? Sukkot? Erev Sukkot. Sukkot would be the... Friday, right, yeah, October 6th. Uh, oh, it's already gone. Oh, oh my God. What are, we, what are you supposed to do on Sukkot anyway? Eat a bunch of crap? Well, I'm sure I did. I can't remember that. You know, it's like 20 days ago. Knowing us, we all eat a bunch of crap on that day, no matter what the hell day it was, right? Right. Because when you're big and fat and old, you eat a lot of crap. crap. That's how you got that way, and that's how you stay that way, if you ask me. 26 past 1, QAM music time. I can't believe Gene Pitney's dead. I think you guys made that up. He died in a hotel. 
Kind okay. of a, probably a broken down hotel too. Kind of, kind of like a floozy place, you know. A flea bag hotel. Flea bag hotel flop with house. roaches, you know. Oh, a flop house. Where you can hear the springs creaking in the bed next door, and some uh, old yahoos are in there just screwing their brains out. Oh God. Twenty-seven past one at five sixty WQAM. That's our um, sports time. And it's Donna Mattress's 30th birthday. I bet you don't have the balls to dare me to play that uh, Vern Troyer thing again. I double dog yeah, dare I you. I got the check. Got my car fixed. It's my birthday. Fixed my own first. You care, right? Got go. Real service, real savings. It's my birthday. And to celebrate their 30th birthday, Donna Mattress and Simmons are offering the lowest price of the year on the best selling Simmons Beauty Rest Pillow Top. You know, that the Vern Troyer spot, maybe the, you know, there are certain TV spots that you can't get out of your mind that mm-hmm. you know, stay with you forever. That one may be the most uh, influential in my life. I just I can't just can't stop thinking about it. You know what I mean? I know what you mean. Anyway, you can choose a dollar mattress from South Florida's biggest selection of Simmons Beauty Rest right now with same day delivery. And if you're finally ready for a good night's sleep, like most of us have been doing for years, do the smart thing this time. Call Dial a Mattress at 1 800 Mattress for factory direct unbeatable prices and award winning service with no nonsense, no BS. Dial a Mattress has 12-month financing for you, and when you do business with Dial a Mattress, they let you pick the date and time for delivery, and they actually show up any day, seven days a week from 8 in the a.m. till 10 p.m. You pick the two-hour window, and they jump right through it, even the very same day that you call if you want. So if you call right now, you can be sleeping in real comfort as soon as tonight. That's why Dial a Mattress is ranked number one in customer satisfaction and why all of us here at QM with the brain use Dial a Mattress. Check them out on the web at dialamattress.com or just sit there, reach for your instrument and your phone, and pick it up and call 1-800-MATTRESS, 1-800-M-A-T-T-R-E-S. Leave off the last S because it stands for Sensational Stupendous Savings. The biggest names, the best talent. This is Neil Rogers, Sports Radio 560, QAM. This week on ABC. Once we dragged you on the dance floor, you were like a disco machine. From the creators of Dancing with the Stars. Come on, it's not the cha cha unless you feel the gentle curve of your partner's glance. Sarah Evans and her husband star in. I once did a naked dance for her. Cheating on the Stars. Did you have any clue that he was uh, cheating on you? No, cheat on you all, damn women. High volumes, though. You know it. Cheating on the Stars. My shrink couldn't make our appointment. He found his third wife in bed with his second wife and got to the Pressing down an entire bottle of Lily Daughter's Prozac. The big gate, golden. You fairy. Oh, my God. That could be the best song in history. Let's do that one again. Let's take that poll. What's the greatest song in history? And it'll always be, uh, you know, Spiral, uh, what, what is it? Stairway, Stairway to Heaven, yeah. Is it a Spiral Staircase to Heaven? <laughs> I think not. Did you actually have a song to say the other day that you liked the Beatles recording of Please, Mr. Postman, which got me very upset, and I started peeing all over the carpet in here? I don't mind it. Oh, come on. Like the better. Come on. All the Motown stuff that they stole money, they stole Barrett Strong's money, and they wouldn't even give it back. Good thing Michael Jackson screwed up Paul McCartney, you know, on that whole deal with the Beatles library. That's not a good thing. Come on, that, that, like I said, it's a bad thing that Paul McCartney's that stupid. Remember yeah. I said yesterday he was dead? There's something you tell. And I actually admit that I like the Carpenter's recording of this song. Yeah. Then again, you know, being... You failed. Don't like the Carpenter's uh, take on sure. it? Sure. I got it somewhere. Think I'm going to uh, whip it out? No. When in doubt, I'm not going to whip it out. There you go. Boy, you are fast today, man. He's on top of it. Woo! This man is dangerous. In fact, you know something? This could be a beginning of a whole new format. I mean, we've done this before sure. and diddled around with something. Bits of songs. Not, 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 not gonna, yeah. Like kibbles, kibbles and Bits. Sure. <laughs> presents the QAM uh, Bits of Music. Yeah, you oh, need a, a song and we'll play a bit. <laughs> like that. 
And if you can name that tune in the two notes or less, we'll give you like uh, a sports clock. So you can always know what yeah, so you always know what sports time is. You said clock, right? Now, don't they have a sports watch? I'm sure there's such a thing as a sports watch, like the one you take to the yeah, track. The, the one that happens in here all day long. They're watching it? All day. William Grider writes about the end game in Iraq in the nation. He's good. He says, the facts are so stark, even American military commanders are now speaking openly about an approaching climax for our bloody misadventure in Iraq. The stand or fall in Baghdad, the New York Times headline declared this morning. A showdown is here, the generals acknowledge. There are no more backup strategies. Learned policy experts from all sides are now debating the various alternatives for an exit plan, preferably with honor, they hope, but getting out is becoming unavoidable, unavoidable regardless. They never said stay the course, did they? No. They would like to dream up some sort of a fig leaf that gives cover to our failed warrior president. Not that he deserves one, but they want a plan that will encourage Bush finally to accept reality. Who is being left out of this momentous discussion? The Iraqi people, whom we allegedly were teaching how to become small-D Democrats. Bush relentlessly touted democracy as his true goal. He cited the three Iraqi elections as proof that he was succeeding. So let's have one more election in Iraq, a referendum where the Iraqi people get to decide whether America's armed forces withdraw and when. This ingenious proposal comes from Harold Davis, an attorney in Douglas, Massachusetts, whose letter to the editor appeared in Saturday's Boston Globe and spelled out the logic. Let's put our Iraq withdrawal to a vote, an Iraqi vote, Davis declared. His proposition is sincere, but also cleverly hoist Bush on his own bloated rhetoric. If the principles hold true, Davis said, shouldn't the Iraqi people hold the fate of the country in their hands? He's got the whole world. Remember who did that? Oh, I don't know. In his hands was on Capitol Records. Johnny Mathis, I don't know. Get out of here, Johnny Mathis, my ass. I bet he would. Jesus. Fining. Davis, Lonnie, not Lonnie Davis. Lonnie Davis, did, does your chewing gum lose its flavor on a bedpost overnight? He's got the whole... Who did that? Now, now, can I interrupt my reading there for a second? Well, that ain't it. What was that? Whole wide world. No, it's not. It's called He's Got. I know. He well, got. I don't got that. He's Well, I got it. I got it in my book here somewhere. I got this. Better. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> Lori London. Never heard of him. He's got the whole world. Well, I mean, I know the song. Sure. His hair. I, just, I don't have it. I guess i got to go get it. Well, what do you mean you never heard it? Never heard of her. Lori. It's not a her, I think. Is it a girl, Lori London? I don't know. Sometimes well, it's it a bus. Can't, you can't tell. Can I get back to this again? Okay. The proposition from this uh, Harold Davis attorney in Massachusetts is sincere, but also cleverly hoist Bush on his own bloated rhetoric. If the principles hold true, David said, shouldn't the Iraqi people hold the fate of their country in their hands? His letter provided sample wording for the ballot initiative. Voters in Iraq would be asked to choose one of the following three options. One, I ask that all coalition forces be withdrawn within six months of the date of this referendum. Two, I ask that all coalition forces be withdrawn within one year of the date of this referendum. Or three, I ask that the government of Iraq determine sometime in the future when all coalition forces should be withdrawn. That sounds reasonable enough, but recent polls suggest Iraqis, if they could get to the polls without being killed, would vote for immediate U.S. withdrawal. Immediate. Will the dwindling ranks of war enthusiasts in Washington rally around Harold Davis's call for Iraqi self-determination? Or does the White House feel that a free election on war and peace would be pushing this democracy talk a bit too far? We can't cut short all the money machine over there, man. There's a big money machine for Halliburton and Bechtel and all their friends. Remember in uh, the Michael Moore movie, and they talked about yeah. all that money that's going to be rolling in? Yeah. Remember that? That's not the head. Good for us and bad for them. Uh, that's right. That's correct. Especially bad for those dead and uh, disfigured and dismembered people. You know, we could have easily made 1500 again today. That could be a regular thing on the show. Well, let's blame Josh. Being, being the wuss that he was and getting all whipped up about that ice cream that's coming from Jackson's tomorrow, Josh just uh, forgot about it. Plus, he had to spend a lot of time there Googling stuff, you know, like. Um, I got Jackson's Charles, fever. Like, yeah, exactly. Like poor Gene Pitney. <laughs> Oh, that in there. Oh, Jane Pitney, he ain't even in there anymore. Like, like poor Martha from Martha and the Vandellas. He's a homely-looking fella. Who's a homely-looking fella? Gene Pitney. No, he was not. He probably don't look too good right now. He looks like a Mark Foley to me. Looks like a Mark Foley. Well, what kind of a comment is that? What is? What do that mean? Oh, and guess what I found? I've been looking for this and looking for it and almost wasted like 12 or 13 or 15 bucks. Went out and bought another copy because I'm so enchanted and enamored with it. Oh, brother. In fact, this one does, it deserves its own jingle. Okay? Do we have time for this? Probably not. But I don't care. Do it. I like that the gasser one that I found. That was uh, outrageous. That was George's doing, by the way. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
<laughs> Here it is. Oh, I don't have it queued up yet. I don't have the song queued up that I want to play, though. Gene Pitney song? No, it's not Gene Pitney. Oh, that. I found my disc standing in the shadows of Motown. Thanks, God. Well, when you lose something like that, man, you have lost... It's like losing buried treasures, you know what I'm saying? It's like losing touch with the audience. I wonder if Ben lives in Harper Woods in Michigan. I Anybody out there hasn't seen the movie Standing in the Shadows of Motown? Now, even Josh saw that, and he, he liked it. Yes, I did. Pretty damn good, even if you're not a big Motown enthusiast. If you're even a mediocre to uh, middle and media uh, Motown enthusiast, you'll love it. And if you are a Motown lover... Oh, Secretary Rumsfeld talks about the timetable for when Iraq and said, but a beep, but a boop, but a down in terms of security. Yeah, he ain't saying nothing. 1,438 votes on the poll. Man, if we'd have leaned on these people like Bill Withers said, lean on me. Remember that? I don't like Bill Withers. Depressing. Mm. More. Right. You didn't like Lovely Day? Lovely Day? I never heard of that in my life. Lovely what? Gay. Oh, never heard of it. I'll tell you who I have heard of, and that's Lou Backroach Chevrolet up there in Pompano Beach because I bought a zillion cars from them. I got two Corvettes from them right now. When I get down to South Florida, I just can't even begin to tell you how much I enjoy driving them. Like up and down in my uh, garage. You're not going to go out on the road down there. Anyway, the service, the salespeople, slash the cars are top-notch at Blue Back Road. They treat you fantastic like royalty, like a king and or queen. And the prices can't be beat anywhere in town. And right now, Blue Back Road is having their race to 1,000. For the first time in their history, they want to sell 1,000 cars in one month. And they got a shot. Just like uh, Jimmy used to say, we got a shot. They've got the biggest selection of new and used cars, including those hot new Corvettes, trucks, SUVs, and minivans anywhere going. They've also got used cars starting at just thirty nine ninety five. every single one of them backed by a Carfax warranty. Loop, what was that? Oh, lean on me, Bill Withers. Lou Backroads out to sell a thousand cars this month, and they're staying open till midnight every night to get the job done. Forget the price, make them any kind of an offer, and they will guarantee you to beat any deal. They give you more money for your trade, zero percent financing, rebates up to six thousand dollars, whatever it takes to get the job done, and put your ass into the car of your choice. Only at Lou Backroads Chevy with two locations: Pompano Beach, a quarter mile west of I-95, and Coconut Creek on 441, just south of the Sawgrass. Don't forget. Lou Backroad staying open till midnight every night. So whenever you're in the mood, like even after work, go see Lou Backroad and get the best deal you ever got in your life on a great new Chevy. Or check them on the web at loubackroad.com. The biggest names, the best talent. This is Real Rogers. Sports Radio 560. QAM. I suck ass. You like raunchy cartoons and get ready for the filthiest one ever on cable. It's Mouth Park. Mouth Park's got bad language. In fact, Mouth Park contains 100% of your child's recommended daily allowance of dirty words. Oh, yes. Mouth Park's got farting, too. 62% more farting than any other cable cartoon. Okay, just that fart makes me want to puke. You want violence? Mouth Park's got it. This week, the fat kid kills his mom. <laughs> Bad language. Farting. Violence. <laughs> Say it all on Mouth Park. For the evening news, it's your choice. Wherever you go, go go with 77 W-A-B-C. Go, go! All right. 147 on all hit music, uh, Radio 560 QAM. Take that sports and shove it. Anyway, here's a fact. Frank in Melbourne says, listening to your bits of rock and roll, you mentioned many times about being in Boston. Did you work as a DJ in town? No, I did not. I was wondering if you ever heard of the Boston area band, Miles Connor and the Wild Ones. Miles Connor and the Wild Ones, never heard of them. They used to be big on the South Shore in the 70s. Arnie Ginsberg claims to have discovered Miles. Arnie Woo Ginsberg, but I did go. I wasn't at this jockey in Boston, but I did go to uh, Arnie's Adventure Car Hop many, many times in Saugus, Mass, on the way to Rockingham Park to plunge my guts out. You ever go to Adventure Car Hop? No, but Boca Brian played me those old uh, audio portions. Of Arnie Wu Ginsburg. He actually used to have Doing a little... Doing spots uh, for Adventure Car Hop and all of these things. A little honker. He was... He was uh, okay. WMEX. Melvin X. Melvin was on that station, too, and Mel Miller. Did that stand for Mexicans? Yeah. Mexican Miller. 
Here's a fact that says, just finished reading the Ballad of Saeed and Nancy. Thank you, kind sir, for posting this on your site. That is one great read. Pathetic state of politics written with a massive dose of tongue-in-cheek disease. Brilliant. Thank you very much for actually reading something that we put on our website that doesn't have uh, four four-letter words in it. Awful lot of farting today on this show, I'll tell you that. 1,453 votes. Noticed. No, I didn't either. I didn't hear any of them. I heard a lot of raspberries, though. Raspberries are good for you, and blackberries and yeah. poisonberries, man. I hate Maybe that's what you ought to put in uh, Josh's uh, breakfast tomorrow what? morning, some poisonberries. Poison berries. <laughs> I don't mean Josh Cordes. I'm talking about Clarence. Better stop calling him that. Clarence. Make it clear, okay? In fact, maybe if you want to share a little bit of ice cream with Clarence tomorrow when Jackson shows up, give him a little with some poisonberry sauce on it. I'll cook some up. Mmm, can't wait. And don't forget a little antifreeze, too, can't hurt. 1,454. You know something? Seriously, if we'd have really uh, put the pedal to the metal, we'd have gotten the 15 again. Does it really make any difference? No, Does no, anybody really. care except... Uh, no. it, it's just, you know, it's just something, right? Mm. It, it's just a little something. So the Muffmeister is going to be in after the show, huh? You fairy! Is he going to announce that he's taken over his PD again and he's uh, uh, got clearance fired? No. No. Oh, how depressing. Now, there was one bloody coup, man, or bloodless. I don't know bloodless. how you look at it. Am I right? It was bloodless. A bloodless coup where Clarence came in and he just stabbed uh, the Muffmeister in her back. <laughs> to which I would say to both of them. You fairy. During an interview on NPR radio, White House Deputy Chief of Staff Carl Rove duked it out with host over uh, polling data, Raw Story says. Well, speaking of Raw Story, i got to check something on there right now. One moment. Well, no, sometimes they'll say uh, we have uh, something big big news. For Raw obtains EPA memo alleging more 9-11 fraud soon, and it's got like dot, 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 and then it's not on there yet. So I'm just checking to see if it was on there yet. Was it on there yet? No. No. The exchange between uh, the host and Carl Rove took place yesterday during the White House's scheduled radio day. After midterm election interview, Robert Siegel stated that many might consider you on the optimistic end of realism regarding Republican hopes to retain both houses in November. Rove suggested that the NPR host was biased. Not that you would be exhibiting a bias or anything like that, Rove said. You're just making a comment. I'm looking at all the same polls that you're looking at every day, Siegel responded. No, you're not, Rove said. Rove said that he was reviewing 68 polls a week. And then unlike the... I bet you even Mark Foley never saw 68 polls a week. What about that? And then, unlike the general public, I'm allowed to see the polls on the individual races as opposed to public polls reported in the media, said Roving Maniac. You may be looking at four or five public polls a week to talk about attitudes nationally, but that do not Im uh, impact the outcome, Rove said. Rove claimed that the polls add up to a Republican Senate and a Republican House. You should live so long, Schmendrick. You may end up with a different math, but you're entitled to your math, Rove said. I'm entitled to the math. The in quotes. He's got the numbers, you know? Aren't you He's impressed? Got the fix. Yeah, he's got the surprise, baby. He's got the machines. He's got those good machines. I only wish it would, but I could find machines as good as the one that those uh, dabbled people are giving to the Republicans. Peter King is worried that his fellow Republicans are turning into wimps. I find it frustrating sometimes with the Republicans. You want to shake them and say, let's do this, said Mr. King, the pugnacious Long Island Republican who chairs the House Homeland Security Committee. A lot of Republicans, when they get thrown off their game, they're scrambling to find a new message. He says, to me, if you believe in what you're saying, you continue to say the same thing. Does that, that sounds like stay the course. No, it, no one ever said stay the course, so stop saying I just what they said. Mr. King is perhaps the last unapologetic Iraq hawk in the entire New York State delegation in Washington. More than any of his beleaguered local Republican colleagues, he is sticking with the original GOP game plan and talking in unrelentingly tough terms about the war. Never mind that the teetering war effort is other Republican candidates all across the country changing the subject and even forced President Bush to abandon his so-called stay the course rhetoric, or as that one caller would say, his rhetoric. <laughs> If you know what you're talking about and believe in what you're saying, go forward. Otherwise, what the hell, King said Friday afternoon at the New York Athletic Club on Central Park South, where he addressed a luncheon for security professional minutes earlier. Not just from the sanctimonious side. I mean, it works. It does resonate, he said. Mr. King, a disarmingly down-to-earth caricature of a gruff 62-year-old blue-collar Long Islander, has earned himself a reputation during his 14 years in Congress as a philosophical conservative but a political maverick, continuing uh, counting among his allies, John McCain, as well as Bill and Hillary Clinton. How do you like that? Now, some polls suggest that he, too, is susceptible to the noxious political climate that's having such a worrying effect on the country's Republicans. He's facing a serious challenge from Dave Mejias. I wonder if he's kin to Roman Mejias, used to play the outfield for the Pirates. Dave Mejias, a Nassau County state legislator who's doing everything possible to paint Mr. King as a right-wing war enabler and lackey of the profoundly unpopular president. A RT Strategy and Constituent Dynamics poll conducted between October 8th and 10th showed Mr. King's lead down to only two points 
47 to 45 percent. He has become himself a living test case for the GOP's worst case scenario, to which all we can say is, oh! all right. 154 is QAM, uh, whatever we are time. The biggest names, the best talent. This is Neil Rogers. Sports Music Sports time. Radio 560 QAM. Oh, God. Getting that straight, our foley's a ho-ho. You fairy. 